uh, contribution that Mr Johnson has made will help to encourage that process this Thursday. Thank you. That ends topical question time. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 12381 in the name of Fergus Ewing on the Legal Writings Counterparts and Delivery Scotland Bill. Can I just point out to members that this is the first bill under our new rules, which allows certain Scottish Law Commission bills to be scrutinised by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee at stages one and two. I'd like to put on record my gratitude to the committee for the work it has carried out on this bill and its contribution to improving the Parliament's capacity to legislate. I would expect further Law Commission bills to be considered in this way. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request speak buttons? And I call on Fergus Schuring to speak to move the motion. Minister, around 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And may I begin by echoing your own words in acknowledging that this bill is the first to have been considered under the new Scottish Law Commission procedure. So we are creating a piece of history today, albeit one which may, I suspect, appear in the minor footnotes rather than the front pages or forewords. Uh, but nonetheless, we must recognise that this is uh, an important part, uh, a new development of our parliamentary procedure. And I'm extremely grateful to the Scottish Law Commission in particular for their work in providing us with this uh, legislation. I'd also like to thank the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for its detailed consideration of and support for the Legal Writings Counterparts and Delivery Scotland Bill and to other members of this parliament, to academics and those in the legal and business community in particular who have also expressed their support uh, for this bill. Um, I hope and expect that the new process which we have seen come to its conclusion in respect of the first bill today, will go towards increasing the implementation rate of Commission reports. Uh, this was a matter to which the late Donald Dewar would often allude, that uh, in Scotland we were the only country in the world to have our own legal system, but to lack a legislature prior to the inception of devolution. Uh, I think these views, presiding officer, are widely shared across the parliamentary spectrum. And in the passage of this bill, we have seen the process working well, and in particular, impressed by the way that the committee has taken on their new role. So I look forward to successive commission bills which will be considered in this way. And to use a non-parliamentary expression, bring them on. Uh, my thanks also to the Law Commission for the sterling work they have done in producing the report, which uh, was met with such widespread support. That makes the task of legislators so much easier when the thoroughness and the diligence of the Commission results in a report which is able to command such widespread support. And that uh, support has continued throughout the Bill's passage. Uh, onto the bill itself, presiding officer. This is a, a small and modest, but nonetheless an important piece of legislation which addresses the current uh, uncertainty as to first, whether execution and counterpart is competent under Scots law, and second, whether Scots law permits legal de delivery of a paper document by electronic means. The bill does two main things. First, it makes specific provision enabling documents to be executed in counterpart. This will put beyond any doubt that it is permissible in Scots law a matter about which there is currently great uncertainty. The committee recognised that the current uncertainty as to whether execution and counterpart is competent under Scots law appears to have led a, to a drift away from transactions being concluded under Scots law with parties instead opting to conclude under the law of a different jurisdiction, for example, English law, where execution and counterpart is recognised. Where Scots law is not used, this may often have the knock-on effect of any consequential litigation not being in Scotland. So a key aim of this legislation is to address this drift. We wish to see legal work undertaken in Scotland so far as possible, and we do not wish the law itself to be a reason why such litigation, why such enterprise should be conducted 
elsewhere. The Bill will give the legal profession and the business interests they represent the necessary confidence to use Scots law for transactions where execution of a document in counterpart is part of the process. Second, it makes provision for the facility to deliver, in the legal sense, traditional documents electronically. There are conflicting authorities on whether a paper document may be legally delivered by its electronic transmission to the grantee or to a third party, such as a solicitor or agent for the grantee. The bill resolves this uncertainty so that any document created on paper may become legally effective by being delivered by electronic means such as email or fax. I was heartened by the unanimous support for the general principles of the bill, both from the committee and from all the members taking part in stage one debate on the bill. Given the permissive nature of the bill, it's not easy to quantify just how significant the benefits of it will be. However, it is clear that all participants in the process agree that it is capable of delivering benefits. Margaret Mitchell, for example, pointed to the positive impact the bill would have on Scots law, helping to ensure that individuals and businesses that seek to undertake transactions in Scotland do not experience obstacles or delay. Jenny Mara com commended the provisions relating to delivery by electronic means, which she saw as increasing efficiency and flexibility. I believe the most obvious benefit of the bill is in relation to transactions where currently Scots law is the obvious choice to govern a transaction, but is not used because of doubt over the legality of executing a document in counterpart. This legislation means that parties will now have the confidence to use Scots law. I believe the bill creates a helpful framework for a variety of transactions, including transactions involving parties in remote rural or island areas where distance itself makes meetings more of an issue. It's a clear strength of the bill that it provides a flexible and light touch framework. Initially, I'm sure that it will be used mainly by practitioners and their business clients for commercial transactions. But I share the view of one stage one witness that by enabling parties to be more comfortable with the use of Scots law, there is potential for innovation to flow from that at some point in the future. I'm grateful to all who gave evidence, both in writing and oral format, to the committee. In that evidence, suggestions were made which were worthy of our detailed consideration. We considered these thoroughly and concluded that the bill, as introduced, was fit for purpose and capable of achieving our policy aim. And I take further comfort from the fact, and I do not know whether this too is a, a, a new chapter in the history of our parliamentary procedure, signing officer, or not, but this bill will have completed its parliamentary passage without any amendment. In summary, this is a compact but vital piece of legislation which will provide certainty in relation to execution in counterpart and electronic delivery of traditional documents in Scots law. We are confident that it will meet a clear and pressing demand from those likely to be affected by the bill, and in my view, the value in bringing clarity, flexibility and certainty to the law cannot be overstated. I hope future Scottish Law Commission bills selected for this process are met with the same level of consensus and success. It's my duty and pleasure, presiding officer, to move that the Parliament agrees that the Legal Writings Counterparts and Delivery Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you, Minister. In relation to your question about whether this is the first piece of legislation that had no amendments, um, can I confess I don't know? Um, I suspect not. I can think of a couple of candidates, uh, but I will check and I will try by the end of the night to come back and answer that question. Um, before I move on to call Lewis MacDonald, can I point out to all members that throughout this afternoon we do have some time in hand. Uh, so if members wish to um, take interventions or indeed to expand the very important points that I know that they've got to make, I would be uh, more than happy, as will uh, the Deputy Presiding Officers, to allow them time to do so. And I call on Lewis MacDonald. Ms MacDonald, you've got seven minutes. Well, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And indeed, it is uh, uh, notable that this is a new departure, whether or not it is the first bill to remain unamended, uh, I, I, I and others will look forward with great interest to hear from you before the day is over. But of course, as you have said, it is, uh, this, as has been said, this is not perhaps the stuff of legends. The Legal Rights Counterpart and Delivery Scotland Bill may not even attract 
very many uh, newspaper column inches out with the specialised press. But as you, presiding officer and the minister, have said, it is significant in its own way. The first bill to come through the new process led by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. And I too would thank the committee for their diligence uh, in this matter. The new process, I think, reflects our shared experience as a parliament. And it is a timely innovation uh, at the very time that the powers and responsibilities of this parliament are set to increase substantially in the period ahead. The bill itself is also a modernising statute in that it seeks to bring the law up to date for an electronic age. The way in which individuals and companies do business is changing and will continue to change and it is important that our legal system keeps up with that process. The case for devolution over the last 40 years has been based on, based on many arguments, both great and small. And since 1999, this Parliament has initiated major changes in social policy, but at the same time, we have also made small but important adjustments uh, to statute in order to deflect changes elsewhere. And indeed, the need to adapt Scots law to reflect change in the modern world has been recognised for even longer. It is now 50 years since the Scottish Law Commission was established to keep the Scottish legal system under review. Mr Ewing uh, referred to the late Donald Dewar and indeed for Scots lawyers like Donald Dewar and indeed John Smith, the process of continually updating Scots law was an important one and the Scottish Law Commission was therefore seen as a very valuable institution. And the United Kingdom Parliament, in their view, lacked the capacity to deliver on all the necessary Scots law reforms that would be required in a timely and efficient manner. With the best will in the world, the parliamentary time available at that parliament was simply never going to be enough. Devolution, of course, was promoted for much wider reasons, but a devolved Scottish parliament has had the additional benefit of offering a way around delays in enacting law reforms on which everyone was agreed. And I think it's fair to say that this devolved parliament has taken a little time to work out the best way to deliver that objective, but there is no need to apologise for that. This is, after all, a maturing institution. We have, from the beginning, passed legislation to clarify the law, for example, to conform to European human rights uh, legislation, fundamental to the Constitution and the founding uh, Act of Parliament that created the Scottish Parliament. But we are now moving on to a new phase, and I think the committee's focus on law reform will prove useful, useful to both the parliament and the legal profession, while the whole parliament remains responsible, as it is today, for the final outcome. The substance of this bill is also welcome. We live in an age of electronic communication and also in an age of ever more rapid technological change. The Scottish Law Commission has rightly identified areas of uncertainty in the application of Scots law to contractual arrangements in this electronic age, and it has brought forward measures to resolve those. And that is what this bill is all about, making clear the terms on which signatures of counterpart documents can form a single agreement, and the way in which delivery by electronic means can have the same effect as delivery of a physical document. There has, as the Minister has said, been little dissent from the terms of the Bill other than to seek increased clarity. And that consensus and its support will doubtless be reflected in our debate here today. But it is important to recognise that the agreement which this Bill represents is one that applies to the position as it is at this particular point in time. It would be a mistake to assume that passing this law will be enough to address the impact of technological change on the terms of Scots law. It will do it for now. But this is certain to be an area which the committee and the parliament will have to revisit before too long. The nature and the pace of technological change are such that we will be back here to repeat this process in order to meet the next challenge that renders the existing status of legal rules and procedures uncertain, whatever that may prove to be. Even as members of this young parliament, we have seen quite dramatic change since the first election in 1999. Those of us who were members from the outset were rightly pleased that the Parliament was ahead of the game in enabling us to communicate by email, to respond quickly to constituents and to access information from across the Parliament and beyond. 
but the scope of that electronic networking has grown dramatically since then. And while the Scottish Parliament was trailblazing in its adoption of new technology compared with older parliamentary institutions, we have had to work hard to stay up to speed and in touch with the people we represent. Indeed, for young people under 30, the internet is not just another tool. It is part of the definition of how we live, as much as an accepted part of ordinary life as phones and planes uh, were a generation before. And if that means constant change and adaptation are required for the Parliament, then the same is true for business, both here in Scotland and further afield. Marketing is increasingly online. Contracts, thanks to this legislation, will go the same way. And the whole idea of how to do business will increasingly reflect that virtual environment in which we all live and work. So this bill is useful, not because it will bring businesses flocking to these shores, but because it will ensure that Scotland and Scots law do not get left behind. The process of law reform exemplified by today's debate does not give Scotland a novel competitive advantage, but it does ensure we are not at a disadvantage and that our Parliament delivers on one of the purposes of devolution. The focus of Scots law must continue to be on the justice system to ensure that our courts are first and foremost about delivering justice to the people of Scotland. But this measure can help to ensure that we also have a legal system which is modern, up-to-date and fit for purpose, that our courts can settle business disputes effectively and efficiently and can therefore support Scottish business and the economy. On that basis, I'm pleased to welcome this bill here today uh, and to offer Labour support for it going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr MacDonald. I now call on Annabel Gould. Ms Goldie, uh, five minutes or thereabouts. Uh, Presiding officer, I, I thank you. Um, I have to say insomniacs might regard this bill to be the equivalent of Mogadon, but to former lawyers like the minister and myself, it is beyond fascination, presiding officer, because the substance of this bill is important. And I would also like to echo the tributes which have been played, paid to the Scottish Law Commission and indeed to the Delegated Powers and Reform Committee of this Parliament. These two groups have performed important functions in getting this bill to its current legislative state. Now, as we've heard, it seeks to improve the way that legal documents are signed and brought into legal effect under Scots law. And it's true, there is currently a great deal of uncertainty amongst legal practitioners as to whether or not documents can be executed in counterpart. 18th century sources indicate this is an acceptable practice, but that is not widely recognised within the legal profession, and signing ceremonies, or as they were known as round robins of one document, have for long been the practice for executing documents in Scotland. However, for multi-jurisdictional transactions that are now commonplace in the commercial world, this can prove costly and inefficient. And it is the case that parties to a contract have often opted instead to use an alternative jurisdiction, whether that is England or even New York, the legal systems of both uh, permitting execution by counterpart. And that is not a positive place for Scots law to find itself. And the desire to reform this area of contract law is understandable. Now, while I'm unconvinced that the bill before us today will give Scots law a so-called competitive advantage, um, as the Stage 1 report highlights, it will put Scotland in a more equitable position with other juri jurisdictions, as Mr MacDonald was also indicating. But I wonder if I might just sound a couple of cautionary notes, presiding officer, as this bill concludes its passage through the Parliament this afternoon. The first is that subsection 4 provides that the single executed document may be made up of all the counterparts or it might comprise one entire counterpart together with the pages in which the different signatures have been um, subscribed. Now, this may have practical advantages, but if that document is registered in the Books of Council in session, this potentially means that the remaining counterparts are lost. And this practice does have implications if at some point in the future a solicitor wants to check the additional counterparts for inaccuracies or inconsistencies, or indeed if it is suspected there has been a fraud. Indeed, the policy memorandum underscores the importance and practice of preserving documents where the transaction involves loans or leases or land. But it seems to me that under the new regime, the paper trail would not provide a complete uh, picture. Um, there was some evidence in this point to the committee from the 
faculty of advocates which expressed concern that execution and counterpart could lead to different parties signing different versions of a document, either through error or through fraud. And Robert Howey QC explained that if one permits execution by the exchange of the back pages of a contract, each signed by a particular party plus the front page, it is all too easy for the rogue or fraudster to amend the critical stuff in the middle of the sandwich. But the faculty, I have to say, was in the, in the minority in giving that view, and it certainly wasn't able to provide quantifiable evidence in support of its concerns, and I imagine for that reason the Minister was not... Certainly, Mr Pearson. Graham Pearson. Yeah, I'm grateful, Presiding Officer. Uh, I would presume that uh, Ms Goldie would uh, acknowledge that, as professionals, the public will expect of the Faculty of Advocates a very high level of attention to the need to administer these documents thoroughly to ensure the kinds of difficulties that Ms Goldie alluded to will be prevented in as many occasions as is possible. Annabel Goldie. I imagine in practice it will probably be less advocates, more practicing solicitors, who will be dealing with the, uh, the actual um, transmission of these documents and the the um, advice on, on, to clients on executing them, but I'll come to that point in a moment in my speech, Mr Pearson. It's a point well made. As I say, the Minister, I think, was perhaps not convinced of the need to bring, in forward, you know, bring forward amendments to provide additional um, safeguards, and I, and I have some sympathy with, with that view. And I do understand that the risk of fraud and error is not new, but even although the faculty's concerns were ultimately dismissed, it's my view that it did put forward valid concerns. I understand the obligation to register a document in the books of council and session is not mandatory. And I think there is an imperative on the law society, coming to your point, Mr Pearson, to issue practice guidance notes to practitioners to ensure there is retained physical evidence of what signatories believe they are putting their names to. And I would also... At I'm into my last minute, Mr Don, so I think I'll just proceed with this, if you will. I can give you a bit more time, if you wish. Presiding officer, how can I refuse? Nigel Don. Well, I, I, I'm grateful and thank you, presiding officer, and, and thank the member for taking the intervention. I think, as I heard the evidence that came before the committee, there was essentially a recognition that if you did allow two different documents, because that's what counterparts were, you did open up the box to them being different. You could do it no other way. And therefore, I think the member has probably reached the right point by saying that those involved, the professionals involved, do seem to need to make sure that those two or multiple copies are available for inspection later. That's the best evidence you've got. But there's no alternative to having execution in counterpart but to have different copies, which could be different. Ms Goldie. I think the, the dilemma, uh, Mr Don, is, is how we as a legislator resolve <coughs> that balance. And I think, uh, to be fair, there is a genuine attempt to try and do that. I've... Um, proffered my own view of what I think the uh, professional body um, which is responsible for solicitors in Scotland uh, might think of doing and I think it has a useful role to play in that respect. But I might say, presiding officer, I would also be minded to strongly urge the Parliament to commit to undertake post-legislative scrutiny of this bill once its provisions are implemented because I think Scotland is a small country, uh, the legal profession is a fairly contained one. I don't think it would be difficult to secure evidence and find out how this is all working in practice. These were just what I described as cautionary concerns. This bill did receive cross-party support at stage one. <clears throat> no amendments have been lodged at stage two. It is broadly non-contentious, and I can confirm that the Legal Writings Bill has the support of the Scottish Conservatives today. Thank you, Ms Gold. We now move to a very short open debate, but... Uh, I'll call Stuart Stevenson, followed by Margaret McCullough. Mr. Mr. Stevenson, six minutes or a bit more. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, can, I, can I just say, my own experience says this is a, a very real issue, and it's not a particularly new issue. Uh, on one occasion, and it was um, 25 years ago, I had to fly from uh, Vienna to San Francisco, uh, so a contract could be signed. I had a very nice dinner with the director at Bank of America, who was the other party to the contract. I had a good night's sleep, and then I got a taxi back to the airport and flew to Glasgow. Total time in San Francisco, 14 hours, and most of it I was sleeping. So anything that helps you address that kind of, frankly, waste of time and money uh, has pretty much uh, got to be good news. Now, quite reasonably, Annabel Goldie, 
uh, raised the issue of different versions potentially being signed in the belief that they are the same version. And one of the things I did pursue during uh, the committee stage of the bill with the uh, Faculty of Advocates and with others uh, is the issue of harnessing the power of mathematics and of electronics to inhibit that po particular possibility. It's perfectly possible with a public algorithm and a public key to derive a hash which represents uniquely a particular document. A single dot, comma, or letter changed in that document resulting in a different key. So even if there are multiple copies, it is possible to know that these multiple copies are or are not identical by the application of appropriate technology. Now, this bill does not provide for that, but it did form part of the consideration of the bill. And I do hope that at some future date, we're able to return to that subject and enable and require that to be used. I can. Mike McKenzie. I, I seem to uh, recollect that this is a similar mechanism that Mary, Queen of Scots, used. Um, and yet her, one of our, or some of our letters were intercepted and which that ultimately, I think, led to our demise. I wonder if you would care to comment on how uh, effective this mechanism may be in reality. Um, uh, Mr. The, Stevenson, the can we kind of keep it on legal writings? I, I w w well, I, I was referring, of course, uh, presiding officer, to some of the stage one matter that happened. Um, I, will, I will simply uh, respond to that by saying that, of course, you have to look at the work of Colville, who was Wellington's uh, uh, decryptor who broke the codes of Napoleon, and that's a much more significant thing. But that's beyond the scope of the debate and perhaps cannot be fitted even in a generous uh, six uh, minutes. But I think the real, the real point that did come up, and we did uh, put to witnesses when we, we had them before our committee, was whether we should get to a position where we create the electronic infrastructure in Scotland so that a single copy can be held in one place and signing can be done electronically from dispersed geographic positions. There was some acceptance by witnesses that that was a good idea, but it was an idea they'd like to be the second jurisdiction to implement rather than the first. But there comes a time when you actually have to be bold and perhaps lift that one up. It, sometimes uh, we, we have to take for granted, if we can't understand, some of the mathematics that make these things possible. And in mathematics, there are P problems and NP problems. Essentially, NP problems are ones that can't be solved. And the encryptions we use these days are of that character. Now, the Faculty of Advocates and others in the legal profession are not unreasonably intensely small c conservative in their approach to things. They want to move in small steps, test, confirm that they work, and provide the necessary security. But the danger with the process that the Law Commission undertakes, a rigorous examination, bringing fully developed proposals to Parliament, extremely helpful. But the danger is that all the contentious and difficult bits have been removed from proposals, and so you end up with something that is a bit of a lowest common denominator. And although this levels the playing field uh, for Scotland, enables us to stand shoulder to shoulder with jurisdictions that allow uh, counterparty operations, it doesn't take us ahead of the pack. And I think uh, the witnesses agreed that there was scope uh, for returning to this uh, 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 sometime in the future. We've got to, of course, if we decide to hold contracts in a central database, be confident that the confidentiality of that document is protected. Now, that raises a really difficult issue for governments of whatever complexion and wherever they may be based. Because governments naturally have a difficulty with absolutely secure secrecy of information, of conversation, of communication. But in this case, you won't get commercial adoption unless that is present. So I think we will need to return, and again, the committee had this in, in evidence sessions, uh, to looking at how we can provide that absolute security, but the legal framework that places such onerous responsibilities on those who use that kind of 
unbreakable encryption, unbreakable security uh, to respond to legal requests uh, for access. Now, that's been done before. It's not particularly new. Uh, so I think that's a subject we need to come back to. Now, lawyers in the committee showed uh, that they were willing to listen to the arguments, but that they would proceed slowly. And indeed, it was 25 years ago, I was invited by the Faculty of Advocates to go and talk to them about uh, whether they could introduce a secure email system. Um, they, they listened uh, politely, but decided uh, they, they wouldn't do it. Now, Lewis MacDonald talked about the generation now people under 30 seeing the electronic world. Well, it's actually 35 years since I first my, sent my first email. So some things have been around an awful long time. And we need to think about you know, how rapidly things happen. My grandfather was born when Abraham Lincoln was president. My father was conceived before the Wright brothers flew. And I was 11 years old when the first transatlantic telephone cable came into operation. So every life takes us forward. We maybe have to speed things up a wee bit uh, in the legal world to make sure that we keep up with the pack, make sure that we can actually draw new business to Scotland, not simply protect the business that we have. This is an excellent uh, piece of legislation. I'm sure all members of the committee very much welcome the gracious comments that the presiding officer opened the debate with. I look forward to hearing what our convener has to say if called to speak, and I see his button pressed. Um, and I'm very happy to support uh, this particular bill and hope that the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee gets many more opportunities to engage in the overwhelming excitement that is legislation in the Scottish Parliament. I now call Margaret McCulloch. Margaret McCulloch will be followed by the convener of the committee, Nigel Dodd. Thank you, President Officer. Before beginning, I want to reflect on when we last voted on this bill at stage one and also on the scrutiny of the bill we've undertaken through the committee. As members will be aware, the subordinate legislation committee's remit was extended in 2013. As a Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, we not only scrutinise subordinate legislation and the delegated delegation of powers, but we also now examine Scottish Law Commission bills of the kind we are debating today. Indeed, this is the first time that a recommendation of the Scottish Law Commission has been brought to the Parliament under the new arrangements. The Scottish Law Commission bill which Parliament is asked to consider is one which has already been passed unopposed and unamended at stage one and stage two, as said previously. And I see no reason for Parliament to reject the bill at stage three. Not only do I believe that the general principles of this bill are sound, but as I will explain, there is a demonstrable need to modernise our contract law in Scotland. The bill essentially proposes to clarify how a document can be executed in counterpart and it will expressly permit the delivery of paper legal documents electronically. In supporting this bill, I hope that Parliament can give clarity on key concepts in Scots law and practice, reflect changes in technology and business practice and make a wider contribution to the Scottish economy. In their work, the Scottish Law Commission have highlighted the need for this bill and demonstrated that there is support for reform across the legal, academic and business communities. They identified two problems with the commercial and contract law in Scotland, which a Law Commission bill could address. They highlighted the need for clarity in respect of counterparts, because it's not certain that a legal document can be brought into effect if it is signed in counterpart. They also call for clarity in respect of the law on delivery, because it's not clear whether a paper contract can be said to have been delivered if it is sent and received electronically. The view of the Commission is that the, is that the law as it stands is not fit for purpose. The letter of our law in Scotland is out of step with contract law in neighbouring jurisdictions. It is also out of step with common legal and business practice. The committee has heard evidence that businesses in Scotland are sometimes choosing to use English law to govern agreements instead of Scots law because counterparts are permitted south of the border. This disincentive to using Scots law, compounded by legal uncertainty over methods of delivery, could be harming our economic competitiveness. 
by allowing the use of counterpart signatures as an option to execute a contract and by allowing contracts to be delivered electronically, we could help businesses make savings on time, travel and accommodation. As I said at stage one, there are only a limited number of people within a business who are authorised to sign legal documents on behalf of the company and the law currently requires more of them than their counterparts elsewhere. In conclusion, President Officer, with this bill, we have an opportunity to remove a disincentive to conducting businesses in Scots law and to make it easier for parties to enter into commercial contracts and transactions. With some small but significant changes, we can bring contract law up to date and make it fit for purpose. It's for that reason that I will be supporting this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McCulloch. I now call Nigel Dawn. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This is a very interesting point to have reached, um, partly because, of course, this is the first bill, as many members have already mentioned, but partly because there is relatively little in this bill. And, of course, even speaking third from the back benches, I find myself in a position where there's actually nothing very much left to, to say about the substance of the bill, which, from my point of view, is actually no bad thing, because what I'd really like to consider, Presiding Officer, is actually the process of getting where we are I'd like to start, though, by thanking my colleagues for their diligence and careful consideration of the bill through the committee. Um, there have been just one or two moments when we've wondered what we're doing next, because this isn't something that we've done before, and how do you handle it when there's ah, no amendments at stage two, and the minister still has to turn up and we read through the section numbers. But uh, we've got there, um, and, and it's been an interesting experience. As other members have commented, Parliament has never historically found enough time for the repair and maintenance, shall I say, of Scottish law. We do now have the opportunity to do so, and indeed we have taken that opportunity on some occasions. Even within my time, presiding officer, I recall in the last session, the Sexual Offences Bill, which came through the Justice Committee from Scottish Law Commission, as I recall, um, Bill Butler brought as a member's bill, the damages bill, which the Scottish Law Commission had brought forward, and indeed the long leases bill, which we started in session three, but was I think finished in session four, was another one that came from there. So we have managed to do some of them, but I think there's been a general recognition that it hasn't really been going fast enough. And um, we need to find another way of operating. We also know, and I'd like to reflect this, that Justice Committees one and two, which did function in the second session, I haven't found anybody who actually thought that was a good way forward, and I haven't found anybody who thought we want to go back to that. But given that the legal system is firmly within the Justice Committee's remit, and we know, and I know very well because I sat on the committee all of last session, the Justice Committee has a large number of things to do. We are, I think, still as a parliament in a position where we've got a bit of a problem in actually moving all this stuff through. The idea was considered in session three but it really only came to a head in this session. Presiding officer, you may recall, uh, and I well recall, an invitation from Roderick Campbell to a meeting on the 15th of June in 2011, when the Scottish Law Commission made one of their periodic presentations to us. And this was the start of this process, presiding officer, because Christine Graham, MSP, the Justice uh, Committee convener, um, and Bruce Crawford, who was the Secretary, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Parliament at the time, were there, uh, as was I, as you will realise. And we actually said at that meeting, we think that officials ought to go away and consider whether we should change standing orders. That was actually the date on which this process, which we are just completing, started. I'd also like to pay tribute, of course, to the many officials under your jurisdiction, presiding officer, who actually did think through how we were going to be able to do this, how we were going to change standing orders, brought forward standing orders that have become workable and which we have used. I really am very pleased because they had to do that work and they did it again diligently and effectively. But that's where we started from. Now, the bill we have in front of us fits those standing order requirements that it would be a bill where there is a wide degree of consensus among key stakeholders about the need for reform and the appropriate and the approach recommended, which of course has been demonstrated by the fact that there are no amendments. The Scottish Law Commission did their consultation so well the government found no need to consult and when we as a committee consulted in the normal way, I would have to say that we didn't really bring up very much that hadn't been said before. 
Where should we be going? And this is what I'd really like to address over the next couple of minutes, if I may, presiding officer. We know that we need to keep Scots law up to date. As Lewis MacDonald, amongst others, has pointed out, modern practice is changing. Not just in commerce, but in the way we do business. I was looking only the other day at some pension funds which I could have accessed online, set up online, paid to online, received payments from in due course online. That is where some of our quite complicated legal transactions are now being conducted and we really need to make sure we have a legal system in which the inevitable errors and faults on the way can be ne negotiated. Not only do we live in a time of the internet, but we also have multinational interactions, inter, sorry, inter, interactions as a result of that in our normal everyday lives. And we also have, I, I would suggest, more multicultural families, more families that are actually the, the result of, of partnerships across nations because we can just now physically move around so much more. Given that that's the environment in which we are having to legislate, in which we are trying to operate, and in which we need to make Scots law workable, I would suggest, presiding officer, that we're going to need to do more of the kind of thing that we've done. Now, we are both well aware that a small bill on succession has been proposed as the next one from my committee. I am sure that both you and the government will ensure that it fits the criteria as they currently stand. And I have no doubt that you will do that faithfully. But having read the consultation on how we might amend succession law, I do have to say, presiding officer, that finding things which are non-contentious is going to be rather more difficult than finding this bill. And I therefore would like to suggest to you and to the Chamber this afternoon that we do probably even now need to start thinking about whether there should be a wider remit for my committee or any other. I wouldn't want to say what the process should be and actually make sure that we can look after the repair and maintenance of Scots law and in particular perhaps private law uh, without it having to go through the Justice Committee for all the reasons that we now well understand. But I commend this bill to Parliament and I thank my colleagues for their diligence and the work that's been done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Don. Uh, we move to the wind-up speeches. Annabel Goldie. Thank you, um, Presiding Officer. I think it's evident from the tenor of today's debate that this bill obviously has cross-party support, and I do restate the support of my, my party for it. I, I think it's clear that members' remarks this afternoon have largely focused on the advantages of the reforms contained in the bill, and that's wise because there has been doubt about whether or not documents could be executed in counterpart under Scots law. This legislation does provide a welcome and perhaps overdue clarification for legal practitioners. And I also acknowledge the need to adapt and change our centuries-old legal system to meet the exigencies of the modern age, and I'm pleased that Scottish businesses will no longer be deterred by the impracticalities of the signing ceremony or the round-robin um, process that has been the hallmark of getting deeds executed uh, to date. Many members recognise the increased speed of transactions and potential savings in travel and accommodation costs uh, will no doubt benefit the business community and this is to be welcomed. I think Lewis MacDonald talked about that as did Stuart Stevenson and Margaret McCulloch. McCulloch. But I do reiterate, I think the issue of safeguards does remain, presiding officer. In his opening speech for the stage one debate last year, the minister emphasised that the approach has been to ensure that the legislation is permissive and as flexible uh, as possible. And I fully accept that's a well-intentioned and well-intended approach, but I'm just a little anxious that the new arrangements could facilitate fraud or, more conceivably, error. I realise, as I said in my opening speech, these are both possibilities under existing arrangements, and I do understand that execution and counterpart is an optional process, but I think uh, most practitioners and their clients will actually opt to adopt what is proposed in this bill. But as parliamentarians, we've got to guard against even theoretical or notional uh, risks. And although the um, committee and the witnesses at stage one were satisfied that such risks were negligible, and I expect their conclusions, I'm not totally uh, in full agreement with that assessment. Uh, on the potential for fraud and error, Stuart Stevenson made a characteristically interesting observation about the role of mathematics and electronics. And I would comment in more detail on that, but I'm not sure I understood it all, presiding officer. Um, I did understand Mr. Mike McKenzie's very colourful addendum to uh, Mr. Stevenson's contribution about the potentially terminal consequences of over-reliance on such techniques. 
I do, however, urge once again that the Parliament should seriously consider post-legislative scrutiny of the Bill at some appropriate point uh, in the future to ensure that if any loopholes have em um, emerged, we can then um, deal with these. And I do also reiterate my view that the Law Society of Scotland should issue practice guidance notes to practitioners to ensure that signatories know what they are signing and that the agreed signed version or a copy is retained in a physical form, whether that's a PDF file or paper copy. Certainly. Mr. Mike McKenzie. Uh, President officer, I wonder if Ms Goldie agrees with me that often uh, contract documents um, consist of huge piles of documents with a cover sheet that's signed by both parties. And really, in principle, there's nothing to prevent fraudulent substitution or indeed accidental substitution of some of the, the meat or filling in the sandwich, even under current procedures. I do accept that, presiding officer, and I think most practitioners and certainly most people signing contracts of that character will be absolutely clear they want to know what the document is and what it is they are signing. Now, the bill makes clear a mechanism for ensuring that this, this can be done. The point is that if you have, in good faith, negotiated a contract, reached an agreed position where you have distilled into the final version of the contract document, and you then get a signing copy of the document and a page to execute a new return the executed page. And it then turns out that through mere error, this has been appended to an earlier version of the contract. Then, you know, that is a mistake that can happen simply because we are departing from the situation where the signature was actually physically attached to the thing. Now, I'm not disagreeing with the need to modernise procedure. I'm not disagreeing for a moment with that uh, proposition, and as I've said, I welcome this bill. But I do point out this is a fairly major departure from what has happened in the past, and there are or there is a potential for difficulty. And I think all I want to be sure about is that we try and minimise that. And I think the Law Society has to roll a, a role to play in that mitigation, and I think this Parliament has a role to play as well. Thank you, Ms. Gold. I now call Graham Pearson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As someone who is not a member of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, I am grateful for the opportunity to wind up on behalf of Scottish Labour uh, in relation to this uh, debate. I am sure there will be those in the public galleries and who watch us on television will be in awe of uh, Ms Goldie's obvious excitement and gushing enthusiasm in analysing the detail of this legislation. Mirrored by Mr Ewing's obvious delight in introducing the details of the legislation to the Parliament today. Uh, on my own behalf, uh, I am uh, wide-eyed at uh, Nigel Dawn's description of our debate today arriving at a very interesting uh, conclusion. Uh, but in truth, putting aside those observations, uh, albeit not the most pressing of issues as far as the Scottish public is concerned. At key moments in their business life, the details of what we discuss in relation to legal writings, counterparts and delivery Scotland Bill will be of critical importance to members of the public at key times in their life. I am grateful, yes. I, don't know. I, think, I think the member has made the most important point is that this is all about how the legal system works. The general public actually doesn't care. They don't want to know. What they want is a system that works. And our job is to make sure that system is good and effective. Graham Pearson. Uh, I'm very grateful to Nigel John, uh, Don for that uh, observation. Uh, and it gives me some comfort to know that I've made some point in the chamber that someone found to be relevant. Uh, in that context, uh, I think that the point that was made earlier uh, in relation to whether or not our modern approach to the signing of documents in an electronic phase adds complication and some difficulty in knowing how these documents have been compiled, I make the observation that, to some extent, those difficulties perhaps pertain to the generation that one belongs to, and that uh, there is no doubt that our younger generation of legal minds may well find it far easier to collect material electronically and ensure that they are gathered 
uh, correctly and with accuracy than they would collating paper in the way that we have done throughout our own working lives. And I think that... The I'm happy to... Um, I'm with the member on what he's saying, but I wonder if he would care to note I've certainly been party to a 3,500-page 3, contract, and therefore it is unlikely that that will be in the front of any single mind, and yet it is a single signature that has to uh, sign it. So whatever system we have, there are practical difficulties that don't get us away from the need for trust and oversight of those whom we trust. Jim Pearson? Uh, I would agree completely with the comment that was made by the member. Uh, I merely remember in a previous life where I had responsibility for creating documents that uh, thousands of people had to relate to in terms of the way they administered their duties. When those documents were typewritten documents, any amendments made to individual pages it resulted in a complete reassessment of every single page thereafter to ensure their accuracy. But once the electronic age came along, as was alluded to by the member himself, any changes are uh, brought to the attention of the author electronically, and one can see if any amendments have been made to a document by whom, at what time, and on what date. And that's uh, enormously valuable to those who might sign off on a document, knowing that its authenticity can be relied on. So I would comment that I'm very grateful to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for the work that they've done in this regard, a novel piece of work which shows that the system of Parliament can operate and can deliver a, a number of practical outcomes which the general public will overlook but no doubt will find valuable in, in times ahead. As someone who has had to access a civil law recently, it took six months to process paperwork uh, in a, a relatively innocuous set, set of circumstances to transact a piece of business. If that time and that frustration can be avoided by the use of electronic communication, that only speaks well for the law itself and for the way in which business can be transacted in Scotland in the 21st century. So the proposal contained within the Act will make Scots law more attractive to its users. It simplifies what up till now has been a relatively complex process in terms of the handling of paper, eh, never mind that the content of the paper itself, and it introduces, eh, one might say, an element of the 21st century into our Scots civil law process. There might be some lessons to be learned on the criminal justice side because a similar process uh, pertains to the handling of warrants and the signature of warrants across the country and the time it takes to uh, obtain these warrants, either for search, arrest, or indeed in terms of the interception of communications across Scotland. And I would like to think that those on the criminal side will have a look at what's happened here and see what lessons can be learned from that example. So, in conclusion, uh, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, have provided a valuable service. It has modernised the uh, Scots law to some extent and makes it more relevant. The Scots Law Commission role should be acknowledged in bringing forward legislation whose time had obviously come and that has passed so easily through the Parliament with due scrutiny and examination. I think that Ms Goldie made a very important point about reviewing the operation of this new practice, eh, particularly in relation to the threat of fraud or incompetent handling, and that review will tell us whether or not eh, the ease with which this legislation passed was effective and efficient in its outcome. And one hopes that the electronic transfer uh, of signatures will be deemed to be an opening door to Scots law becoming attractive internationally and that in due course people will wonder what all the fuss was about. I am very grateful to you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Pearson. Can I now call on the Minister to wind up the debate? Mr Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me thank all the members who have contributed this afternoon uh, to this debate in 
the final stage of, uh, of the legal writings. Uh, Counterparts and Delivery Scotland Bill. Um, I, I wanted to address some of the points raised in the debate, presiding officer. Um, first of all, a, it's been asked when we intend to bring the legislation into force, and the answer is as soon as possible. And on the assumption the bill is passed today, we hope to commence the substantive provisions of the bill around three months from now. Mr. Don raised the question of uh, future bills adopting this procedure and he did inform the House that it is under contemplation that the second bill under the new procedure will be the succession bill which I understand the presiding officer is expected to be referred to the committee when it is introduced in Ju June 2015 subject to it meeting the necessary criteria for referral and Mr Don touched on that. Um, he also raised issues about the procedure adopted here and how it be applied. That's not for me, presiding officer, so I won't go into that. However, I can say that the Scottish Government does echo the sentiment which he expressed, which I think underlay his criticism, which is that we require to have a process for repair and maintenance of Scots law. I think that was a sort of prudent comment and one upon which it may be sensible to ponder further. Let me turn now to some of the substantive comments which were made on the bill and which were made in the course of passage of the bill, both at uh, stage one and uh, a, a here this afternoon. And firstly, I think Annabel Goldie, in extremely useful contribution for which I am grateful, uh, raised and postulated a number of questions, a number of questions which I believe were raised, uh, most of them were raised, perhaps not all of them actually, in the committee. Some of them were raised by the Faculty of Advocates uh, uh, witness, others by other members of the legal profession, others by John Scott, her colleague in the committee. First of all, in relation to fraud and error. Well, starting off with fraud, um, fraud is something which uh, MSPs and parliaments cannot stamp out. Fraud occurs. It is, sadly, part of uh, life as we know it. I suspect it always will be, no matter what law is passed. In Scotland, in my experience and my belief is that fraud is rare and honesty is the norm. And if that analysis is correct, that is something for which we should be extraordinarily grateful and something which we should cherish and foster as a society. But we cannot rule out fraud. And I do not believe that anything in this bill increases the possibility of, of fraud. Uh, it may be argued, in fact, that those who will have recourse to using the benefits of this bill, if one likes to put them that way, will in fact mostly be the legal profession advising businesses in the execution of what may well be highly complex documents. Mr. Stevenson referred to one document, his experience having 3,000 pages. Many other contractual documents will involve tens, twenties, or even more parties who have to execute it. Lawyers will tend to be involved, and therefore I, I think it's reasonable to say, without putting lawyers in a higher plane of relative honesty to the rest of the populace, that, that uh, one hopes. I, I'm pleased to hear there's general assent to that proposition about the <laughs> honesty of lawyers, not something that one hears every day, perhaps. But, uh, but nonetheless, that uh, does seem to me to indicate that if there is a difficulty, it will not be fraud. Any difficulties the parties have for the contracts may well be the content of the contracts. Uh, but of course, as soon as Scots law permitted documents to be validly executed when they didn't require to be executed on every page, presiding officer, that could be said to have increased the propensity for fraud to be effectively accomplished. I believe it is the case, although I uh, am certainly no expert that some documents, including wills, required until rel relatively recently, as, as recently as the early 1970s, to be signed on every page. Or maybe it was even more recent than that. And of course, there is a particular reason for documents to be signed on every page. But if one takes Mr. Stevenson's example of a contract with 3,000 pages, or perhaps four or five pages, but several annexes, are we really saying that we are going to impose on society a legal system where every such page requires to be signed plainly. 
that uh, would not be a sensible way to proceed. So we've moved away from that. As soon as we move away from that, there is, I think, in theory at least, the propensity for fraud. Uh, and I think I was able to demonstrate one example of such a fraud which has taken place, and this is a matter not of uh, a private matter, but one which has come into the public realm and has been raised uh, with uh, ministers, namely the case of Brebner, where a first page of a disposition was, defraudulently, was fraudulently replaced with another and which has resulted in an enormous uh, difficulty. And therefore, fraud does occur, and I accept that, but I, I believe that the circumstances in which this bill will be used will tend to minimize that. Uh, if the, there is the, the second, uh, and of course I should say that a party is not bound by a document which they have signed as the result of a fraud, perhaps induced to sign a document, perhaps somebody elderly induced to sign a document against his or her will, if that is brought about as a result of fraud, that contract will be void. Similarly, if a signature, if my signature is defrauded by somebody else, that contract will be void. It will not be valid. So the law does, if you like, provide protections against fraud. But I think perhaps more likely is the case of error rather than fraud. And I think I'm correct in saying that the witness from the Faculty of Advocates said so as well, presiding officer. Uh, and uh, that the parties simply will not have validly executed in counterpart uh, if they inadvertently sign different versions of the document because the bill only relates to documents which are executed in two or more duplicate interchangeable parts. If they have signed different documents, these provisions do not apply. Now, I see that all too soon, presiding officer, I'm running out of time. I had meant to carry on for... Uh, for quite some time. Um, I had meant to comment on Mr. Stevenson's remarks where he managed to bring in references to Napoleon, Mary Queen of Scots and the Wright brothers. How he did that, I'm not quite sure, but nonetheless, his speech was of occasional tangential relevance. <laughs> Ms. Goldie's contribution, by contrast, was uh, an example of painstaking forensic analysis of the highest quality, as we have come to expect over several years. And I, I must bow to her superior research, as I have not looked at that 18th century precedent presiding officer. The shame of it. But in conclusion, and that notwithstanding, uh, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to thank everybody involved in this bill who have been thanked already, but one other group who haven't been mentioned uh, at all, and that is the officials who have uh, provided their support, their official support to myself and who have uh, done so in an exemplary and professional fashion. They have uh, made sure to make a serious point that the points raised by the Faculty of Advocates were pursued and I undertook on the 28th of November that I would ask the Faculty of Advocates if they had anything else to say. We did not get a reply so I think one can infer that perhaps they were satisfied with the responses that I gave to Parliament with the benefit of advice from the Scottish Government Civil Service. Therefore, in conclusion, presiding officer, a range of good points have been made. Some other ones have been made as well. I, uh, <laughs> I welcome the cross-party support for the bill. Uh, I think it will make a difference. I think it will help to save time, a great deal of time, and perhaps a little bit of money, and it will make a modest but positive contribution to the legal profession and indeed perhaps to enterprise in this country of ours. I commend the bill. Many thanks. And that concludes the debate on the legal writings, counterparts and delivery Scotland bill. And it's time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12382 in the name of Keith Brown on building Scotland's infrastructure for the future. Could I invite those members who would like to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please? And once members have changed seats, <coughs> I now call on Keith Brown to speak to and move the motion, Cabinet Secretary, around 13 minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome this opportunity to debate the role of infrastructure investment and to speak about recent activity and the prospects for the future in terms of infrastructure. Despite uh, Westminster's real terms cuts of around 25% to Scottish capital budgets between 2010-11 and 2015-16, we are taking decisive action to accelerate and sustain economic recovery. 
As confirmed in the budget earlier this month, we will secure investment of almost £4.5 billion in 2015-16 by way of our capital budget, new borrowing powers, revenue-funded investment, regulatory asset base uh, rail enhancements, capital receipts and, of course, allocating some of our resource funding to capital assets. This investment will support an estimated 40,000 full-time equivalent Scottish jobs across the wider economy over the year. And our infrastructure investment plan sets out a long-term strategy for the development of public infrastructure. It sets out why we invest, how we invest and what we will invest, what we'll invest in from now until 2030. It also provides, crucially, uh, certainty and transparency to markets and the construction industry by outlining a clear pipeline of major infrastructure projects. And next month, uh, President Officer, I plan to announce the third annual progress report relating to the plan, together with updated investment pipelines. And these will show that significant progress has been made in delivering the plan. Uh, today is also a good opportunity to, ref to reflect on the excellent progress made already this year on our major infrastructure priorities. First of all, the Queen's Ferry Crossing, Scotland's biggest transport infrastructure project in a generation. Uh, this project is on track to be delivered on time and within the revised lower budget range. Last month, the New Bridge's three giant towers reached half their final height and 10% of the total bridge deck is now in place either side of the towers. The project is providing up to 1,200 job opportunities and a large number of subcontract and supply order opportunities for Scottish companies. The new South Glasgow Hospital was handed over to NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde by the contractor at the end of January. The new campus, which is one of the largest hospital complexes in Europe, has maternity, paediatric and adult hospitals all integrated onto a single site. I will do. Gavin Brown. In the plan next month. In terms of the plan that he is going to publish, what assumptions does the government make about the future status of NPD projects? Cabinet Secretary. I think Gavin Brown will know that there is a challenge from Eurostat currently in terms of the classification of those. We remain confident that uh, non-profit distributing uh, models are viable and we believe we can meet the requests of Eurostat, but we're working currently on that with the ONS. So it's our intention to proceed and continue with uh, non-profit distributing models, which have been hugely successful. Uh, the delivery to go back to the Glasgow Hospital was achieved ahead of schedule and within budget and the overall migration and commissioning process is expected to be complete by June 2015 and at its peak that project supported 1,500 jobs on site. Uh, our £1.8 billion Schools for the Future programme, which will deliver more than 100 new or refurbished schools by 2019-20, has 18 schools which are complete and open to pupils. 16 currently in construction uh, and it's estimated to support an average 1,500 jobs at any one time throughout its duration. Uh, earlier this month, presiding officer, I uh, was at the track laying for the Borders Railway project as it was completed between the Borders and Edinburgh. That's the longest domestic railway to be built in the UK in more than 100 years and it's now reached a significant milestone and this keeps the line on track to open for passengers in September 2015. And the reopening of that line offers a once-in-a-generation opportunity to deliver a major economic and social boost for the communities that the line will serve. In just a few short months from now, trains will be carrying passengers to employment, social and study opportunities, as well as bringing visitors and investors to the communities all along the route. In addition to the work being progressed on the A96 duelling Inverness to Nairn, including the Nairn Bypass project, we are also pushing forward with preliminary engineering and strategic environmental assessment work along the whole corridor. And that's the first, but uh, not the least important step in developing a robust plan to improve connectivity between Inverness and Aberdeen. And I believe it demonstrates the Scottish Government's commitment to investing in that strategically important route. It will also mean by the time that's completed that every single city in Scotland for the first time will be connected by either a dual carriageway or a motorway, something really which should have been true many years ago. I will do. David Stewart. Developments uh, on the Aberdeen to Inverness uh, route. Uh, but would the Cabinet Secretary share my view that it's also important to invest at rail at the same speed as investing in train and, and investing in road in order to give passengers alternatives? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's certainly important to make sure that we bear down on journey times right across the rail network. And I think we've done that in many cases. And if you look at, for example, the Egypt project, which my colleague Derek Mackay oversees, 
The result of that will be a 37-minute uh, journey time, which is compatible, uh, competitive, in fact, with uh, car journeys. But I would say that the rail infrastructure that we're dealing with is, in many cases, Victorian and has not had the investment it should have had over previous decades. Uh, the current uh, Transport Secretary, Patrick McLaughlin, came to Scotland some time ago and said the problem in Scotland is that the transport infrastructure has not been invested in for decades. And he was right. He was also an ex-transport minister back in 1989. But he was right. And we are trying to rectify that. So whilst I do agree with um, the point being about trying to improve these journey times, it is not possible to do everything at once, as I'm sure is understood. Uh, last November, as I say, one of the biggest contracts to electrify, just to go back to the very point that Dave Stewart raises, uh, the biggest contract uh, to electrify the main Edinburgh to Glasgow rail line was awarded, and that £250 million deal, forming part of a £742 million Edinburgh to Glasgow improvement programme, marks a significant milestone in the project, which will provide, as I've said, 20% quicker journey times and 30% more capacity. It will also complete an overhaul of stations in both cities with the new look tremendous Haymarket station already completed on time and under budget and the planned transformation of Queen Street station into a 21st century transport hub. And last October we announced the bidders competing to win the contract to deliver the first of 12 major duelling schemes in the £3 billion A9 duelling programme. The King Craig and Dalradi contract worth around £50 million is expected to be awarded this summer with construction starting thereafter on the five-mile long stretch of the A9. And the Scottish Government has made duelling of the A9 a priority, and I am proud that we were the first administration ever to do that, recognising the range of economic and other benefits that this can deliver. Uh, Presiding officer, I would also invite the Parliament to welcome the significant progress we are making across the length and breadth of Scotland. The £3.5 billion MPD hub investment programme uh, is acting to deliver additionality in our programme in the face of what I think everybody can agree are constrained capital budgets. Uh, and that programme is a central component of that approach. The £1 billion extension to the programme which we announced last year will build on the success of the programme to date. And I'm pleased to say that whenever there has been an opportunity to invest further in our economy, this government has taken that opportunity. In relative terms, our MPD investment programme is currently one of the largest investment programmes of its kind in Europe. And there are projects totalling more than £1.6 billion currently in construction. Earlier this month, uh, NHS Lothian's Royal Hospital for Sick Children, Department of Clinical Neurosciences and the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service project reached financial close. That project is the first acute hospital facility to be procured under the MPD model. And the development brings paediatric care, specialist neonatal care, neurosciences and adult and children's emergency departments all together in one place, making access to services much easier for patients and health professionals alike. And that new building is anticipated to open in autumn 2017. And the largest contract within the MPD programme was formally awarded in December for the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route Balmeri Tipperty Scheme. And at a recent meeting in Aberdeen, presenting officer with the First Minister, she announced that we had just cut the sod on that scheme to a resounding cheer from the four to 500 people and members of the public that were there. That's how long anticipated this project has been. It's the biggest civil engineering project that that area has ever seen and will bring substantial benefits. I think we estimate around £6 billion worth of benefits over the length of the project, uh, both to communities and businesses and individuals across the whole of the northeast of Scotland. And construction will support around 1,500 jobs and over 100 apprenticeships, graduate places and other training opportunities. That scheme's already bringing short-term economic benefits through £221 million of subcontracts, either put to the market or soon to be advertised, and longer-term benefits estimated, as I say, to bring around £6 billion of investment, around 14,000 jobs to the North East over the next three decades. And the scheme will be delivered in stages, with completion expected in winter 2017, around six months ahead of schedule. And the two earlier stages are the ones where we've listened to local communities who said they wanted to see, first of all, Balmeri Tipperty brought forward, and also that area around the airport, which I'm sure Dave Stewart knows very well as well, uh, is, which is crucial to the economic activity within that area, getting to the airport and the city centre. So those two things are areas where we've listened to the local community and will advance those two stages. Other major projects within the programme currently uh, in include uh, Inverness College and the City of Glasgow College, which between them are expected to provide facilities for nearly 50,000 students. Uh, Ayrshire College's Kilmarnock campus, which will deliver state-of-the-art learning facilities and will play a huge part in the ongoing regeneration of the town. 
and of course the M8, M73, M74 motorway improvements, which will create hundreds of jobs and drive significant economic safety and accessibility benefits. It reminds me of the fact that many people in Scotland don't actually appreciate we don't even have a full motorway between Edinburgh and Glasgow as things stand, but this project will remedy that by making sure we have motorway all the way through, as well as the surrounding projects, such as the Wraith Interchange. I will do. Well, I'm interested in the projects and indeed welcome many of the projects that he's outlined. I'm also interested in just a bit of detail on the £180 billion that the First Minister indicated would be invested in the next Parliament, as to whether he can indicate when that investment would start, what year, and in cash terms, what would be the breakdown for each year, how much money extra would be invested in each year. Does he have those figures? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, indeed, I do, and I'm happy to provide them uh, to Willie Rennie. The £180 million is obviously over the course of the next Parliament, uh, and that's across the UK as well. So that would be uh, the case where Scotland would get its proportionate share. And it seems to me eminently sensible for the First Minister to have said that for a, a small uh, reduction in the austerity measures which have been pursued by the administration, which uh, Willie Rennie supports, we can alleviate some of the harm and also create a huge amount of benefit by using that £180 billion across the UK for employment opportunities. So I would have hoped that he would have got on board with that. And of course, I know as he said in his amendment that uh, he thinks that's irresponsible of the SNP government. I would only point out that uh, the administration which he supports, the coalition, said that they would reduce the deficit by this stage, by this time, to £5 billion of a surplus. And in fact, the reality is there's a £50 billion deficit. Now, I've already heard from Willie Rennie. Now, that coalition uh, promise has got about as much weight as a Liberal Democrat promise on tuition fees. It's been proven to be wrong, and I think the approach taken by the First Minister is a much more rational one. Uh, our MPD projects have had a good response in the market and the international investor community, and there have been strong interest... I will do, yes. Joanne Lamont, forgive me if I can take the, the Cabinet Secretary back to the point you made about the City of Glasgow College. Will he confirm that there will be no consequence for colleges like the one in one constituency, Clyde College, in order to fund the City of Glasgow College? There will be no reduction in provision at Clyde College in order to make the finances stack up for the City of Glasgow College? Cabinet Secretary. No, the funding for Glasgow, the new Glasgow City College has been allocated for quite some time, in fact, back to the time when I was the Minister for Education, back 2010-11. So the two things are not related. Um, as I say, we've had a significant level of international investor interest, funding for both the M8, M73, M74, a motorway improvements project, and the AWPR. Funding has been supported by the European Investment Bank and a group of investors managed by Allianz uh, Global Investors, one of the world's leading integrated financial sectors uh, and one of the leading providers. And that demonstrates the confidence that there is in the marketplace and the international investor community in the NPD model, and that overall Scotland's infrastructure is seen as a viable and desirable long term investment. Uh, and Parliament will be aware that infrastructure investment in its widest sense is very central to the government's economic strategy. In the digital sector this year, we will extend access to next generation fibre broadband to 85% of premises across Scotland in order to stimulate Scotland's digital economy and support businesses to take benefit from a uh, digital, digital economy. Uh, our approach to housing and regeneration is fundamental to the government's overall purpose of sustainable economic growth, tackling inequality, addressing market failure and creating jobs and business opportunities opportunities. We're spending more than £1.7 billion in the housing sector to deliver our target of 30,000 affordable homes during the lifetime of this Parliament. And we'll continue to support large-scale regeneration projects in 2015-16 uh, through Spruce, the £50 million Jessica Loan Fund and the £25 million Regeneration Capital Grant Fund. We'll also continue to recognise the need for synergy between Scotland's infrastructure and the rest of the UK. Uh, the Scottish Government supports high-speed rail, but not just to Birmingham, Manchester and Leeds. To realise its full benefit to the UK, the network needs to be extended further and faster to reach Scotland. That will help us rebalance the British economy and assist with ensuring future competitiveness and economic prosperity across Britain. So today I would challenge the other parties when they have the chance to speak to say quite explicitly, do they support high-speed rail coming to Scotland or do they not? It's a simple question, deserves a simple and straightforward answer. Uh, we also continue to facilitate infrastructure investment by others and are actively promoting innovative finance to lever in public and private investment. That is true of the National Housing Trust Initiative, the Tax Incremental Financing Scheme, which of course we have the Glasgow City Council's Buchanan Quarter Project uh, and Falkirk Council's Grainsmouth Project active in that area, as well as the Growth Accelerator model, which is extremely important. Uh, last August, we announced the Scottish Government invest half a billion pounds in infrastructure in Glasgow by way of a city deal agreement between the Scottish Government, UK Government and the eight Glasgow and Clyde Valley Councils. 
Uh, presiding officer, the Scottish Government recognises the importance of infrastructure investment and I have set out today some of the significant steps we are taking to expand investment to secure economic recovery. During 2015 alone, I expect that infrastructure projects worth around £1.5 billion will complete construction and be ready for use and investment supported by this Government in schools, colleges, hospitals and transport. The steps we are taking demonstrate not just what is being achieved, but also what more could be achieved if the UK Government were willing to change its course on public spending. This Government has made that case consistently, and I invite Parliament to support it today. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. And I now call on Mary Fee to speak to and move Amendment 12382.3. Around nine minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome this debate on building Scotland's infrastructure for the future. Today's debate allows us the opportunity to recognise the key role that infrastructure plays in our communities, our towns and our cities. And across Parliament, we may disagree on the strengths and weaknesses of Scotland's infrastructure. However, we should all agree that developing a strong, forward-thinking infrastructure policy is crucial to a sustainable and prosperous Scotland. This debate gives us the chance to pause and reflect on where we are with our current infrastructure investment plan and reflect on some of the successes and challenges that have been experienced. Investing in major infrastructure projects is a central element of the Scottish Government's strategy to promote economic recovery. The five largest infrastructure programmes currently under construction are key to improving Scotland's roads and rail network. The five projects will cost a combined £3.8 billion to build, the estimated combined budget commitment over 30 years, reflecting building, financing and operating costs, is £7.5 billion. And the Scottish Government considers this spending affordable in the, the long term, but still needs to demonstrate the, the reliability of its analysis, leading to concerns over budget cuts across the portfolio, impacting on possible service delivery. Key to Scotland's future infrastructure are the hugely important city deals. With an investment of £1.13 billion from Westminster, the Scottish Government and participating local authorities, the Glasgow City deal is an example of when we can come together for the greater good of Scotland. The City deal is expected to raise £2.2 billion for the local economy, as well as creating tens of thousands of jobs through its construction phase and many more permanent jobs thereafter. The City deals create economic growth through infrastructure, innovation, jobs and skills and should be commended for their cross-party approach. Many of the infrastructure projects I have detailed have an enormous benefit for our local and national economy. And whilst looking at how to build Scotland's infrastructure for the future, it's of benefit to reflect on some of the practices that have gone before and how we can improve on those going forward. As of August last year, a third of the projects set out in the infrastructure investment plan have been approved and are under construction whilst 60% have not had an outline business case approved. Good quality business cases are vital for project scrutiny, decision making and transparency. However, according to Audit Scotland, the business Audit Scotland for the Borders Railway and Egypt project, business cases were not complete and up to date at all stages. And consequently, at certain decision points, it had not fully demonstrated the viability, value for money, and affordability of the projects. And in the same report... Yes, certainly. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I hear, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, an echo of previous reluctance from the Labour benches to support border rail. Is the member suggesting the money being invested in border rail should have gone elsewhere? Mary Fee. No, absolutely not. Um, there is no reluctance on my part to support um, borders rail and I was pleased to hear the Cabinet Secretary mention when he was speaking about updating um, on projects and I look forward to the updates that the Cabinet Secretary will give us. And in the same report, the Audit Scotland recommended the Scottish Government needs to improve public reporting of infrastructure projects. Except for the fourth replacement crossing, Government have not informed the public or the Scottish Parliament of the combined estimated financial commitment arising from these projects and reporting of the building cost estimates for other projects has also at times been incomplete or inconsistent. And a litany of projects have been delayed, including the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, Borders Railway, Egypt and the duelling of the A9. And this was on top, 
Yes, very briefly. Yeah. Mike McKenzie. Do you accept that when campaigners block projects through legal action, there's really not much that government can do about that? Very few. I'm really not sure if a response is required to that point. Um, the cancellation of Garrel, in which almost 29 million of taxpayers' money was also wasted. And if can, can I make some progress on this? And I'll, I'll, I'm covering Garrel again um, slightly later. If routine public reporting of these infrastructure projects was to be undertaken, then delays and cost increases could be better understood. One other project where openness and accountability would be appreciated is the Scottish Government's handling of Glasgow Presswick. The report by Audit Scotland shows that the Scottish Government plans to sell Presswick Airport back to the private sector are viable, but it could take until 2022 for the airport to become profitable. And it is recommended that the Scottish Government gives a clear vision and strategy for Presswick Airport, which takes into account the airport's future development potential. This should include robust business and financial plans, a full evaluation of potential risk, and a well-defined and regularly reviewed exit strategy, setting out the timescale for selling the airport to the private sector. There are risks to each project. However, more needs to be done to ensure new infrastructure projects are developed in a more strategic way, including ensuring transport links are an integral consideration in the planning process. And my colleagues will discuss in greater detail Crossrail cross Egypt, the city strategies and Glasgow Presswick. However, in looking forward for Scotland's infrastructure, one area where I would like to see improvement is community engagement and community buyout. Last Monday in Glasgow's East End, I visited four community-led projects, a housing association, a community transport project, a community hut hub and a forthcoming music venue. These projects are run for the community by local people, not pushed by government or council. And there is a duty for all levels of government to have a role in supporting the advancement of community projects across Scotland. Between 1999 and 2007, we achieved real change in many communities across Scotland through redevelopment and regeneration of areas because it was the communities that picked up the baton and challenged and led their communities to change for the better. And I want to see us support communities again to develop, encourage and embrace a community spirit that will bring long-term positive change. There's a legal requirement for developers to consult communities on applications for national and major developments. And the idea for standards came from people on the front line of community engagement. More than 500 people from the statutory and voluntary sectors and the communities themselves were involved in developing and producing them. However, the National Standards for Community Engagement has not been updated since 2005, and it's now time to take a look at how we engage with local communities when building Scotland's infrastructure. Engaging with communities and service users should be an instrumental part of any infrastructure investment plan, especially when it comes to public transport. We must make sure that local people have a say about the trains and buses in their area. We need to regulate bus services to ensure that those who rely on them can continue to use them without their route being threatened by cuts. And by backing Ian Gray's bus bill, we give local councils and SPT new powers so that they have some control over routes, timetables and fares. Yes, very briefly. Yes. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Mary Fee for taking the intervention? And just to ask her the question I asked originally, because I know she's running out of time. Is it the case, as Jim Murphy has said, that he's not in favour of high-speed rail stopping in England, that she supports high-speed rail coming to Scotland or not? Mary Fee. I confirm that I support high-speed rail coming to Scotland. Scottish Labour has already announced, in line with our counterparts down south, that we will seek to bring the rail franchise to a non-profit contract. Scottish Labour is also committed to investing in Glasgow's Crossrail scheme, which would potentially carry up to 4 million passengers a year, and according to SPT, could create up to 130 new jobs over 10 years, while contributing 36 million to Glasgow's economy. One final area that needs to be considered when looking at building Scotland's infrastructure is how to incorporate low carbon infrastructure investment. As WWF points out, the decisions on infrastructure taken now will have an impact for many decades to come. Scottish Government decisions on infrastructure investment need to match the ambition of Scotland's climate change legislation. 
And in, conc in conclusion, the government's motion for this debate rightly recognises the importance of infrastructure investment in sustaining economic growth. We support HS2 as it would deliver high-speed rail to Scotland. However, the motion chooses to entirely blame Westminster for spending deficits whilst not acknowledging their own budget responsibilities and decisions. The amendments by Gavin Brown and Willie Rennie both acknowledge the key role infrastructure plays in driving forward regeneration and acknowledges the need for openness, accountability and strategic guidance. My amendment identifies the need for more strategic and focused approach whilst recognising the pressure that we are under. And I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Gavin Brown to speak to and to move Amendment 12382.1. Around six minutes, please, Mr Brown. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll start by uh, moving the amendment in my name. I was interested to open my first email this morning. My first email was an email from the Scotsman with the news summary. And the first item in there was an article about how the tough transport supremo, Keith Brown, was going to destroy the opposition parties in a debate today. He was using this debate as a platform to put them on the rack over high speed too, and that was the centrepiece of his speech and indeed the entire debate. So imagine my surprise when it only actually entered his speech 14 and a half minutes into a 13 minute speech, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, where almost, almost under his breath, he whispered that he was going to be pushing HS2 in this debate and move swiftly on, swiftly on to talking about housing trust as quickly as he possibly could. I have to say, if that was him pushing opposition parties, deputy presiding officer, I look forward to hearing him when he's consensual and deciding not to push opposition parties too hard. I'm happy to give way to Mr. John Mason. Mason. I'm interested that the member thinks we should, he should push things because his, his amendment mentions no projects or anything positive whatsoever. Gavin Brown. Presiding officer, our amendment I think is very clear. It asks for the investment update plan to be published as soon as possible. And I'm sure Mr Mason will realise that that investment update plan includes every project, not just some of them, every project that the Scottish Government is doing and some of them that they are probably not doing as quickly as we want. So uh, Mr Mason really ought to read amendments a little more carefully uh, before jumping in uh, with interventions like that. But let me pick up on uh, one of the points because Mr Rennie in an intervention to the Minister asked about this magical £180 billion. Pounds. The First Minister dreamt up this scenario where you could quite easily find an extra £180 billion pounds and nobody would notice. Nobody would notice there'd be no impact at all. Now, it has taken the best part of a week, I have to say, to get any detail from the Scottish Government about where this money is coming from and what they're actually going to do. And what is interesting is this, Deputy Presiding Officer. If you follow the Scottish Government plans, it means that you would eventually eliminate the deficit in 2024, almost two full parliaments away before you actually start to attack and eliminate the deficit. Deputy Presiding Officer, what also then happens to public sector net debt? Well, that barely shifts over the entire four-year projection. It starts at 81, it goes to 79% of GDP. Presiding Officer, what impact would that have on the markets? What impact would it have on the cost of borrowing? And actually, how much extra would it cost Scotland and the rest of the UK in order to get this magical £180 billion? Pounds? We don't know, Deputy President. Officer. But, perhaps, but perhaps Mr McKenzie will be able to shed some light on the issue. I'll give way to, to Mr McKenzie. Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you uh, for taking an intervention. I just wonder what impact you feel that Mr Osborne failing to meet every single target that he's uh, pledged himself to with regard to borrowing. What impact has that had? Gavin Brown. So perhaps, perhaps we need to send a copy of the budget to Mr McKenzie and indeed the Autumn Statement, because on just about every economic measure, much to his dissatisfaction, I'm sure, the plan appears to be working. Higher growth, we'll come to deficit, higher growth uh, than any other G7 country this year, uh, projected to be higher than every other G7 country apart from the United States next year. We have the highest employment we have ever had. Unemployment, while too high, uh, is far lower than it was expected to be, at just over 
compared to France, where it's 10 or 11 percent. And the deficit, well, as a member knows, the deficit was 10 percent, almost 11 percent of GDP uh, when the coalition took office. It's round about 5 percent of GDP now. That's called cutting the deficit in half, Deputy Presenting Officer. And the member, as the member probably well knows too, by 2017-18, uh, there is a projected small surplus. So it has been delayed a few years than was planned, but it certainly hasn't delayed two full parliaments under the Sturgeonomics uh, plan that the Scottish Government appears to have concocted. Let's deal with a couple of other issues that he came up with, though, because he complained, of course, about how the capital budget has been cut. But, of course, it is entirely up to the Scottish Government how much money it decides from its budget to put into capital. It can't do it the other way around. So if it was complaining about revenue, uh, we'd have to take it on the chin. But actually, if the Scottish Government wants to shift money from revenue into capital, then it is perfectly at liberty to do so. And to no real measurable degree has it chosen to do so. They complain, they complain bitterly about the amount of money available. Yet if you look at 2011-12, there was a £30 million underspend on capital. £30 million that the government wasn't able to spend on capital. Now, I accept that Keith Brown wasn't the infrastructure minister at the time, and perhaps on his watch it will be different. But that year was not alone. The following year in 2013, £29 million that they were unable to spend on capital. That's £59 million just over those two financial years. Perhaps Mr Brown will do better than that, and I certainly hope he will. But if they're unable to spend all of the money then it's a bit rich to complain about the level of money. I think I only have 15 seconds left, but I, I should give way to them. If, I'm, if there's any leeway, I'll, I'll certainly give way to him. Okay. Thank Cabinet you. Secretary. Thank you, Brown, for giving way. And just to help him out, because I know he's coming towards the end of his speech, if he feels able yet to respond to the point, does his party support high-speed rail coming to Scotland or not? Gavin Brown. I don't know why he asked that again. Every single time we've been asked that question, we've said, yes, of course we do. We always have done. But it's interesting to note that actually the Scottish Government only ever want to debate this issue in the run-up to a general election. The last time the Scottish Government wanted to debate High Speed 2 was in the run-up to the last general election. We supported it then, we support it now. Yes, of course we do. But actually, perhaps in the interim, Mr Brown might want to focus on some of the rail services for which he has direct responsibility. Because in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, he might want to focus on Scotland because in a briefing from Transform Scotland, they said this, Scotland's rail network north of the central belt is in dire need of investment. But what promises do we hear from the government there? They point out that in 1895, one could get from Dundee to Edinburgh in 57 minutes, but nowadays the fastest rail trip is 64 minutes. Deputy Presiding Officer, he would do better, the Scottish Government would do better, to focus on the powers they have, to get their own house in order before they start blaming everybody else and complaining about the powers they don't have. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I now call on Willie Rennie to speak to and move Amendment 12382.2. Around six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin by moving the amendment in my name? The Government motion today asserts that £180 billion can be borrowed without adding to the national debt. But when the Minister was asked for some details, starting year, breakdown year by year, he said he had the detail, then there was a lot of bluster, and then there was absolutely no detail at all. So in something that is central to the Government's attack on the UK Government, he hasn't provided any detail at all. It's not a worked-out plan, it just seems to be a slogan. I'm surprised that the Scottish Government thinks it can just put forward a slogan and that it should provide some detail instead. So I want to give the Minister an opportunity again. Can he provide me the detail right now? I'll take an intervention. If he can give me the breakdown, £180 billion, when does it start and how much per year? Can he give me that kind of detail? Cabinet Secretary. Happy to do so for the benefits of Willie Rennie. £25 billion in 2016-17, £43 billion in 2017-18, £52 billion in 2018-19, and £60 billion in 2019-20. A total of £179 billion. Are you going to support that now, Mr Rennie? Willie Rennie. The fascinating thing is it's taken me to intervene on the Minister, the Minister to intervene on me, to provide any kind of detail at all. Any kind of detail. And the minister, the fact is the minister still believes that borrowing that amount of money 
will actually reduce the national debt. It won't actually increase the national debt. I don't know what kind of economics that he's involved in. I would like to know from the Minister, perhaps you'll give me another intervention. How what will the interest rate be? How much will the government pay extra for that £180 billion? Does he have that kind of detail? Can he tell me? Well, first can of all, I don't think to... anybody can uh, anticipate what the interest will be, given that the Government of the Bank of England has been talking about possibly negative interest rates. But can I say, given what he just said, does he continue, even given the wipeout which Lib Dems are about to experience at the election, yeah. to continue to support austerity? Is that, is that the only thing? This poverty of ambition, the ambition for austerity, is that the only council that Lib Dems have? Well, you know, what the Liberal Democrats have been involved in is making sure that we have a stronger economy with 170,000 jobs, which I don't think any member on the SNP benches will probably be too embarrassed to mention today. 170,000 extra jobs in Scotland as the result of our economic plan, a plan that they said would not be effective. But the reality is that the Minister doesn't want to tell us how much extra the cost would be of borrowing that amount of money, because that would have a direct impact on schools, hospitals, road projects, rail projects, right across Scotland. This is not free money. The reality is it would cost us, and it would cost us dear. So the irony is that the SNP propose to use the UK growth, the growth that I've just talked about, Gavin Brown has just talked about, to fund that extra borrowing. That is the price. That is the irony of what the Minister has outlined Today, the government, the UK government, has taken a responsible approach to balance the long-term costs of borrowing against the entirely natural desire of ministers like Keith Brown to spend as much as possible. But that is the balance that the SNP are going to break. And if they could tell us any kind of detail about the future, how much this is going to cost, then I would have greater confidence in the minister to handle these matters. But the balanced approach of the UK government is about to be undermined if the SNP were to get its own way. And we, always, we know it's a bad idea, because of those members, and I'm sure every member on the SNP backbenches, will have read the Fiscal Commission, which recommended that the Scottish government should follow the UK downward trajectory on dealing with the deficit. That is about to be ignored today, consigned to the dustbin. That is the impact. All of this just simply for a slogan. I want to also add to the points that Gavin Brown has made today about the Scottish Futures Trust. My party has been concerned about the way the Scottish Government and the Scottish Futures Trust has handled capital spending. Remember that the Trust couldn't get 80% of its capital out of the door in the first year. Now we find from a written answer not from an oral statement in this chamber, but from a written answer from John Swinney, the eight hub projects that were due for financial closure are being delayed. So can the minister say whether these will include projects like Muir House Centre in Edinburgh as part of the Lothian Health Bundle, Kelso High School, Anderson High School in Lerick, New Battle High School, Baldragan Academy in Dundee, many other projects right across Scotland will be potentially directly impacted by the government's mishandling of this project. And on high-speed rail, my party has been committed to high-speed rail and bringing it to Scotland. We don't need a motion to tell us to do that today. Gavin Brown is right about that. I'm interested, however, in what has happened to the Scottish government's plan for a high-speed rail route between Edinburgh and Glasgow. This was announced back in 2012. An SNP press release said at the time, and I quote, the SNP has refused to wait for Westminster to put Scotland in the fast lane, has committed to high-speed rail between Glasgow and Edinburgh. The press release went on to say, this announcement from the SNP government means we will have high-speed rail even before the completion of the London to Birmingham HS2 line. Even before the completion of the London to Birmingham line. But yet now, according to reports from the newspapers, that the high-speed rail line needs to be brought to Scotland before anything happens here. And it gets worse. An official from the Scottish Government said, nobody has actually announced high-speed rail. Nobody from the Scottish Government has announced high-speed rail. So we need some clarity from the Minister. What's happened to the promise that this would get 
in Scotland before it even got to Birmingham. Where are the details? Where's the plans? Where's the route? We need to know that kind of detail, or is it just another one of the government's promises that comes to nothing? Thank you. Thank you. Now I turn to the open debate. Um, I would be grateful if members who wish to speak in this debate could ensure that the request to speak buttons are pressed. At speeches of six minutes, I call Mike McKenzie to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Thank you, President Officer. One of the defining features of this government's budgets over recent years has been that transfer of budget from resource to capital in an effort to at least partially offset the damaging cuts from Westminster, which have disproportionately targeted capital spending. And it's difficult to follow the logic of the London government in cutting the Scottish government's capital budget by a full 26%, because it's the exact opposite of economic wisdom and recession economics. The logic of capital investments in infrastructure is not just about the economic multipliers that accompany such investment. It's not just about the increased number of jobs that this supports and creates. It's also about our long-term competitiveness. Because capital investment is not just an investment in the, presence, the present, it's also an investment in our future. And without this investment, our competitiveness declines. Without this investment, our productivity declines. And without this investment, our national wealth and well-being decreases. And all of our problems and all of our challenges increase. But this policy is not just about throwing money at public projects, as Labour did, or throwing money at the private sector through PFI contracts, as both the Labour and Tories would like us to continue doing. It's about steering a prudent middle course, and it's about seeking genuine value from the public investment. And it's about ensuring added value from public investment, showing there's a virtuous course to be steered between public inefficiency that we used to hear about on the one hand and private sector greed on the other. And perhaps no project exemplifies these virtues better than the Queen's Ferry Crossing. President officer, I would have settled for on time and on budget for the Queen's Ferry Crossing. But at this stage in construction, to be on course for on time and below budget is a remarkable achievement. achievement an achievement that we should rightly celebrate and a, an achievement that we should learn from. A standard that we should set for all public contracts. Because when we set these high standards for pu public sector project delivery, then we can also set a sustainable model for comprehensive and continual capital infrastructure investment and improvement. And then we can also bring into being the long-term certainty that's provided by the infrastructure investment plan. President officer, it's a great pity that the Labour Party has forgotten the lessons it learned from Keynes following the last Great Recession. It's a great pity they're unable to learn the enlightened view of debt that he demonstrated in negotiating the war debt over a suitably long period. And it's a great pity that they've forgotten the lessons from their political forefathers who built their way out of the looming post-war recession, for they understood that you can't cut your way out of recession, not if your goal is long-term competitiveness, not if your goal is long-term increases in productivity, not if your goal is long-term prosperity. But you can build your way to prosperity by investing in infrastructure, by investing in jobs high-quality jobs, certainly. Gavin Brown. The, the £180 billion that he talks about, would his preference be to use taxation to collect that £180 billion or to borrow the £180 billion or a mixture of the two? Mike McKenzie. That's a, an interesting uh, um, 
intervention because Gavin Brown knows full well that it's a more complex scenario than that. Gavin Brown knows that by stimulating growth, taxation will increase and that it's not a, met a matter of higher punitive tax rates. It's a matter of stimulating the economy and thereby increasing taxation. And, I, as, and I'm pretty sure that Gavin Brown also knows that had Mr Osborne followed that kind of wisdom, we would be in a far better place than we are now. Because, or, as Gordon Brown said, nobody, or got, unlike what Gordon Brown said, nobody can stop the boom and swamp cycle. And it just so happens that we're approaching the boom phase of that cycle now. But, you, as I was saying, you can build your way to, towards prosperity by investing in infrastructure, by investing in high quality jobs and by investing in our future. And that's why this SNP government is calling on the Chancellor to use his budget to scrap the austerity project, to bring forward a, a half a percent year on year increase to budgets, only a half a percent. Because this argument is not about cutting the, the, the debt, it's about how we cut it. It's about the speed of debt reduction. And it can be done in a way, if we keep on Mr Osborne's course, in a way that leaves a harmful legacy, or it can be done the Scottish Government's preferred way, where we continue to invest more in infrastructure, building our competitiveness, building our productivity, and building a better future for everyone in Scotland. Thank you. I now call Joanne Lamont to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And this is, of course, an important debate, and I'm happy to contribute to it. Those of us who have been here since 1999, and actually I think I'm the first person in this debate who have been here as long as that, and no, I don't look it, um, will know that the whole debate around infrastructure projects has not necessarily always been a happy one, whether it's been this building itself, whether it's been the trams, or indeed whether it has been Garo. And I think there have over the time, whether it's the Western Peripheral Route and the Huddigan Roundabout, of which I knew probably far more than was healthy for me when I was leader, it feels I've been talking about these things since Methuselah was a boy. But we know that the reason they have been contentious is because we precisely understand why infrastructure and investment in construction is so important. And I welcome the fact, for example, it's an inquiry into the trams, but I do regret still the decision to sell off the land around the Garrel project when still the idea of Garrel remains alive, because it makes it more difficult to resuscitate that project at a later stage. But we do know that the importance of infrastructure projects is particularly important in tough times. I know in my own constituency, the construction of the M77 wasn't just about incre increasing transport uh, um, measures, but actually opened up economic opportunity to parts of my constituency that wouldn't have been there otherwise. The truth is also the case in the M74. But we also know that in order to get benefit from infrastructure projects, things don't happen by accident. And I would be interested in the view of the Cabinet Secretary, who precisely takes the lead amongst the government's agency in linking the creation of economic opportunity, ensuring that a community and local regeneration level that is, is delivered. I would also make the observation that in tough times, I think we have to apply a different set of rules to infrastructure plans than when resources are perhaps easier. In my view, there is a huge opportunity through infrastructure to create jobs, to support local businesses, to sustain communities, but that is not inevitable. And in fact, I have been on record regretting the way in which the Queensferry project was let meant there was less opportunities to create economic opportunities for local business. And I think contracts are different at different times. Simply saving on a budget is not necessarily in reality a saving when you're denying yourself the opportunity to create these economic opportunities at a later stage. And I would ask the Cabinet Secretary, I do believe that it's essential that there's a rigorous reporting or analysis of the economic, social and environmental impact of particular infrastructure projects um, that have already happened in order to inform us about how these should be taken forward in the future. He will know as well as I do the importance of particular infrastructure in creating and 
directing the role of our cities. We've heard a lot about city deals and so on, but we also know that that ability of cities to generate economic opportunities at that level can be supported by decisions made at a Scottish level. And I would simply reflect the importance of Crossrail at this time, and I know that others will be talking about in particular regard to the west of Scotland and Glasgow in particular. But I hope the Cabinet Secretary will forgive me if I concentrate on one particular infrastructure project, and that is the New South Glasgow Hospital, which of course is referred to in the motion. We know this is an important development, it's exciting, it's massive. We commend all of those who have brought it to this stage um, with so successfully the amount of work that that will create, has created and the opportunities it creates in the future. We recognise it as a Glasgow facility, a Scottish facility, a centre of excellence beyond Scotland itself. It's not just a health project, but a very significant um, opportunity for, um, economically, both at a construction stage and at this later stage. We know that that project was delivered through cross-party support. We know, and I certainly welcome, the improved health outcomes that may come from that development and also the opportunity for local jobs and local economic um, regeneration as a consequence of so many people being in the locality. But I cannot overstate the degree of unease, if not anger, locally about the impact of this project on these communities. We, as a cross, on a cross-party base, I believe a responsibility to respond to and respect that concern. The impact of a significantly higher workforce, the number of patients who are coming in, the way in which it is drawing business related to medicine, the way in which academic university research work is being drawn to that area. There's a huge impact on the workforce of simply accessing their work as a consequence of this project. But it is a massive impact on the local community, particularly in relation to parking and transport. Inevitably, measures will need to be put in place to protect local streets. There will need to be parking measures, but local people resent in the strongest terms the need for them to have to pay for that as a consequence of decisions that were out with their control. I think it's essential to understand and take responsibility and seek to mitigate the impact of such an infrastructure project um, on local people who say, yes, we've got Scottish-wide facilities, we didn't ask for it, but we're going to have to pay for the consequence of that. I think we need to look collectively at looking at the transport support that's there. What resources could be provided to ease the impact on local people? A project worth £800 million, I believe it would take a tiny proportion of that to, make, to ensure that the hospital is a good neighbour to local communities rather than a concern for them. It is a national project. In this motion, is argued as, if not boasted of, as a national project. So I believe it should be seen as necessary to, um, to address the consequences of that national project. I believe the Scottish Government is part of the solution. I have already spoken to the Health Secretary about this. I do not believe this is a matter for the health budget, but I do think it's a matter for the infrastructure budget. I urge the Cabinet Secretary to meet with me, and if possible with constituents and groups, to respond to their concerns, to understand the significant impact it is having on them, and to identify with all of those who want to celebrate this great project solutions that will address their concerns. I repeat, I welcome the hospital. I celebrate the difference it could make to people's lives. But in conclusion, I do hope that in his summing up, the Cabinet Secretary or indeed the Transport Minister will confirm their willingness to meet with me and with others to identify the resources that are a logical conclusion of the already put in investment of £800 million, where it will address that very strong sense of injustice at local level, that they are having consequences of something that we all want to celebrate. If we want to see that hospital open in the best of circumstances, I think it's now incumbent on all of us to find a way of responding to that, not by taking out of the health budget or the council budget, but directly out of the very budget that we have celebrated as creating jobs and opportunities, both at a local and a Scottish level. Thank you. I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Nigel Dorn. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And while I speak in this debate in a personal capacity, I draw members' attention to my honorary Vice Presidency of Rail Future UK and to my being the honorary President-elect of the Scottish Association for Public Transport. Um, and by the way, in the current climate, I say I receive no pay 
whatsoever for either of these appointments. Um, and perhaps also I should say, of course, that I'm a regular user of the One Scotland card, uh, which gives me access to scheduled bus services throughout Scotland at no cost to myself. Now, it's a timely debate, in my case, to celebrate what's uh, been achieved in public transport and to highlight some of the remaining uh, challenges, interesting contributions so far. Um, I take it, uh, given the remarks of Gavin Brown, that he is responsible for the fact that today, uh, it flying from central London to central Paris is slower than it was in uh, 1931, uh, when the Imperial Airways Service, which operated from Croydon to Le Touquet, uh, cost four guineas, a lot cheaper than today. Although, of course, the value of money is different. And I take it that Willie Rennie, in uh, criticising uh, proposals to spend more on capital expenditure and improve the economy, reductio ad absurdum, would abolish the entire uh, capital programme, because that would be of enormous enormous benefit uh, to the economy. Uh, but I carry it a little further than perhaps he would seriously uh, take it. Now, on our railways, uh, we have a network in Scotland that makes a great deal more sense than many geographically. Less than 10% of uh, rail journeys starting in Scotland end out with our country. And that's a smaller proportion than is the case for any other area of the Great Britain rail network. But that's to underplay two very important things about cross-border rail. First of all, uh, only 10% or so of public transport journeys from Scotland to London are by rail. Most are by air. And that is a ferocious and unnecessary burden on our environment. Now, currently, times favour favor air. Uh, travel times are slightly better by air, perhaps by around an hour. But the reliability of rail travel is substantially greater, and the nature of rail travel from city centre to city centre without mode change and, and transport that gives you access to Wi-Fi, hot and cold running drinks and uh, relaxation uh, means more relaxed, more ready for work passengers at journey's end. And if we look at what's actually happening on climate, uh, they're having the worst uh, of all winters on the east coast of the United States, telling them the effect, effect of climate change. And on the east coast, we're seeing significant, uh, significant uh, problems in getting access to water, which is now extending into the Midwest in the summer showing that if you over-exploit the environment, the environment will bite back. So the issue of high-speed rail is both economic but also climate. We have to get out of there and onto rails. Now, in the shorter term, if we can speed up the journey, that's going to be helpful, and it has to happen soon. It will take some time to get HS2 into place, but there are huge economic benefits as well as uh, huge uh, benefits uh, to the climate. So it's one of the most important projects for everyone who lives in this island and people who live around the world that we address that issue. I want to just say a few uh, targeted remarks chosen more or less at random uh, from some of the things that we might be thinking about doing that we haven't heard from for. First, perhaps, we need to look at the rail infrastructure to better support freight. We've seen huge success up to Inverness with Tesco putting its dry goods uh, onto the railway network, and that's a huge number. Uh, if it's very brief, please. David the Stewart. member give way, and I think it was in the member's uh, remit when he did a lot for Freight Facilities Grant. I strongly support Freight Facilities Grant, but would you share my view that it's crucially important, particularly for North Lines, that we have a more duelling of track, because the basic problem we have is lack of constraint or lack of capacity in these lines. Well, where freight is concerned, it's actually a slightly different problem, I may suggest. I do not underplay the value of duelling, but not for freight. For freight, if we're to get the fresh goods onto the rail network, the important thing is that we have a resilient network with alternate routing, so that the delivery of fresh goods is not compromised by technical problems that will occur in the best managed of networks. And I think that's where we need to freight enable more of the network, the alternate route round by Aberdeen. We've done quite a lot under the previous government 
and under this government. And to that extent, I hope that we'll see uh, signalling between uh, Aberdeen and Inverness become a priority. I mean, it's quaint and fascinating to see the token working between Elgin and Forrest, but really a 160-year-old system might be capable of being updated. And by the same token, north of Inverness, it's perhaps time we saw a little bit about the plans to replace the obsolete, no longer just obsolescent, obsolete uh, radio uh, token system. And looking to roads, the success of the average speed cameras in the A9 saving lives, reducing accidents, and improving journey times overall for the mix of traffic that we have, I think indicates that we should have more of that on our road neck work across Scotland. I hope that uh, Willie Rennie will speak to his colleague, uh, Danny Alexander, um, who, 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 who should be prepared to change his mind, as others have done uh, on other subjects. Uh, presiding officer, I travelled uh, on the Stirling Alloway King Cardinal line on the day it opened, uh, travelling on the footplate of the Great Marquis, uh, a steam train. Uh, I've diaried to travel on the first day of the Borders Rail. I travelled across the uh, fourth uh, road bridge in 1964, and the day it opened, my great uncle was chair of the campaign committee in the 1930s for that, and I very much look forward to crossing at the earliest possible opportunity on the new uh, road bridge across the fourth. We're making huge progress. There will never be a day when we don't have more things each and every one of us want to do. We have to prioritise. I think broadly we're making good choices. I look forward to much more being spent on rail, perhaps, uh, than has been in the future as a share of the budget. But good progress and congratulations to the government. Presiding officer. Thank you. I now call Nigel Dawn to be followed by Paul Martin. Thank you very much, presiding officer. I have to say that this is one debate which I could look forward to as an opportunity to talk for half an hour about capital investment and infrastructure in my constituency would require no notes whatever. However, I haven't got that long, which is why I do need some notes in order to make sure that I stick somewhere near a script. Um, I'd like to start by addressing the issue which has been raised by Gavin Brown um, uh, and, and Willie Wren, Rennie, because I think we need to just bear in mind that capital goods, and these gentlemen know this, capital goods are not just money spent. You actually get quite a lot of things for capital expenditure. You get the capital goods themselves, which may have enormous value for a very long period of time if they're properly constructed, and we live across daily bridges that were constructed, goodness knows how long ago. You get the benefit of the capital in the short term because it was a project which had some justification. There was some benefit to be derived on an annual basis for that capital expenditure, otherwise it would never have been chosen. You also get the opportunity, and Stuart Stevenson pointed out one of these. Just improving the railway network gives you an alternative way of getting there. It's the kind of redundancy you need in any system. That's why electricity systems have multiple loops in them in such a way that if something breaks down, actually the sky doesn't fall in. That's the kind of benefits you get from just improving infrastructure systems anyway. You also get work, jobs, productive jobs, skilled jobs, opportunities for apprenticeships, and training, which means you're able to develop the skills of those who are coming along. And you're also retaining the skills of those who are actually working on the job. And if anybody was to talk to the construction industry at the moment, you would, they would recognize that one of the real problems the construction industry has is that the downtown has actually sent skilled people away and they're struggling to get them back because they've gone to do something else and to some extent they've lost those skills. Those are some of the benefits, and I would just gently point out that the economic multiplier is greater than one. Actually, capital expenditure is the thing to do. Yes, you do have to find a way of paying for it in the short term, but it is well known that you get that money back in time. So, Frank McKenzie was absolutely wrong with this, is absolutely right. The discussion about whether you're going to pay for it by borrowing or tax actually does become redundant at a half a moment, because in time, the tax will replace the borrowings. Gavin Bray. In all that he has just said then, why did the Scottish Government only switch a tiny fraction of funding from revenue to capital? Nigel Dawn. Um, I am not going to answer for every pound or penny or even a million, but let's be clear that that's always a choice because you have other things to do with that revenue, particularly when that revenue is dropping. So it is always choices, and we know that. And we know it is always choices, and no one's ever denied that. 
Now, presiding officer, um, I wouldn't get through this afternoon without mentioning some of the issues in my constituency, because probably my constituents wouldn't let me. Um, but I am going to pick up on just one thought from what Joanne Lamont said, if, if I may. First of all, can I say I do have to agree with that. I think we should have an assessment of projects. I don't know quite how long it takes to get there, but I really do think, and I suspect the Scottish Government does this, a serious look at the numbers and the benefits, because unless we learn from things that were done past, it doesn't matter whether we did them or you did them or you know, people before you did them, unless we actually learn the benefits and try and get to the economics of that, we're not going to learn the lessons. Um, and we really should be doing so. Can I also actually sympathise with the problem um, about parking around a hospital? I was elected as the councillor for the Nine Wells Ward in Dundee uh, about three weeks, I think, before they brought in the parking scheme to accommodate the fact that the car parks had then been privatised. Can I sympathise at a personal level with the problem of actually having to deal with that? However, it is not insoluble. The issue is to make sure that it's seen to be... Uh, handled sensibly and sensitively to everybody involved. But I do understand there's a problem there. Right, presiding officer, I have two minutes to consider the issues. My constituents would be extremely upset if I didn't start with roads. Can I say that there is absolutely no need to talk about the Lawrence Coat Junction to the Cabinet Secretary, and therefore I am not going to, but it is at least mentioned. Trains, I think this is actually one of the important issues about which we could uh, wax eloquent for quite some time. We do need, I think, to do what we can to improve the network. Our great-grandchildren are going to wonder why we spent so much money on roads. There's an answer. We know the answer. It's the current way of doing things. But they also, we also know, and they will recognise, that actually the better way to move a stuff around is on railways. And it's a great pity that Dr. Beeching got his axe out when he did, because you know, we're living with the consequences of that. I merely mentioned that actually the best way, I would suggest, in terms of routing to improve the position from the central belt uh, to Aberdeen is actually to come up from Dundee via uh, essentially the route of the A90, which would re um, uh, would, would put railways back into Forfar and Breakin and allow them to Lawrence Coat, but actually eliminates the, the problems around Montrose, and I'm sure the Minister will, will either be aware of that or reflect on them in due course. I'd also like to reflect, Presiding Officer, that the Government has spent quite a lot of money on flood protection. Um, significant money visibly being spent in Breakin at the moment, and another scheme to come in Stonehaven in due course. These things are important, albeit that perhaps they get forgotten about rather a lot. We've also got three new secondary schools being built or finished in the, in the case of Merns Academy, and I'm grateful for those, as of course are my constituents. But I'd like to finish by looking at the position on broadband, because it's entirely clear to me that we are moving to a situation where government resources need to be uh, focused on broadband. The government knows this. I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know. But our ability to deliver on the NHS in remoter areas, of which I have many, is only going to be done if we have the ability to Skype or the equivalent, all right? You need broadband up the glens if those folk are not to be seriously disenfranchised. That's plainly where BT is not going to know, go. I have talked to them about it. The Cabinet Secretary managed, uh, mentioned 85% coverage. The trouble is that I and he have got some of the other 15%. Those 15% are going to be seriously disenfranchised if we don't grasp that thistle somehow or other please, we need to find a way of addressing that. Though I recognise it should be UK money, but that's for another day. Thank you, President. Many thanks. I call Paul Martin to be followed by Jim Eady. Uh, President Officer, can I say, uh, like ours, and I think for every speaker so far, uh, we've all repeated the point of the importance of uh, investing in Scotland's uh, future infrastructure, and I think we're all at one in that, and I think there are several strands to this debate which I think we can take can take place, and that's some of the local interests that we have, and at the same time, the national interests that we have at the same time. Uh, I would like to, first of all, start with uh, a local interest regarding uh, the Robroyston area uh, in my constituency, and the Minister is aware uh, of the background concerning uh, Robroyston, uh, the fact that it's, since its conception came forward from Glasgow City Council's local uh, plan. It's always been intended that a railway station would be developed uh, in Robroyston since the development of Robroyston, which has seen uh, over 2,000 two houses been built uh, since the 1990s, uh, and there continues to be development uh, in the Robroyston area. Uh, and I have welcomed the uh, interaction with the Minister on this subject, along with other uh, elected representatives, and I think it's welcome that we've moved forward. Uh, but the Minister is aware that we are at the stage uh, of taking forward the appraisal 
uh, of uh, the Rob Royston railway station. And we're at that crucial stage uh, where our application has to be submitted uh, for final approval from the station fund. And I would welcome clarity from the Minister in his concluding remarks uh, in respect of the stage that the station fund is at in terms of the expenditure that's available to the station fund uh, and indeed uh, if the fund is still accepting uh, applications uh, as we speak. And I think the Minister has uh, and all of us have recognised the importance of uh, Rob Royston railway station in the future of not just the Rob Royston area but the railway, rail network at the same time. President officer, I think uh, we also recognise on a national level, and can I just say in respect of uh, the future of Glasgow, uh, it does depend on the necessary funds being put in place to develop a transport infrastructure that deals with many of the challenges that Glasgow faces. Uh, and if we look at the population of Glasgow, over 600,000 people, it's not just that population that we have to support in Glasgow, but it's also those who depend on Glasgow's infrastructure to travel uh, to and from uh, work as part of their everyday uh, working lives. And I've got to say, on a less positive note, uh, President Officer, uh, the concerns that have been raised by a number of Glasgow residents in respect of the uh, cancelling of the Garrow uh, project. I think we need to recognise that when it was revealed in uh, October 2013, there was 30, uh, nearly 30 million pounds of public money was spent uh, on the butchered Glasgow Airport Link proposal. And it was interesting to note that from a spokesperson, and not from the government directly, uh, their quote that says that £176 million of capital investment had been saved as a result of cancelling this project. Now, I think the Minister does have to answer for the fact that this was a project that was agreed in this Parliament by the vast majority of those who are represented here today, also government ministers represented here today, uh, supported the Garrow proposal. And I do think this would be uh, I'm more than happy if John Mason wants to apologise to the Glaswegians uh, for the cancelling of the Garrow project. I'd be more than happy to give way to John Mason. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for giving way. Uh, I mean, I wonder if he would uh, accept that the difficult argument for Garrow is because the, the airport is so close to the city centre, the bus link is so good, that the, the, it, the rail does not really give a lot of addition. Paul Martin. Uh, President officer, I, uh, I, you know, I challenge John Mason to meet with those who commute to and from uh, Glasgow Airport and tell them that they have a good bus link in place. I've never, in any of the feedback that I've either heard from the constituents or indeed the business community who supported this proposal, ever heard the comment, yes, we are very happy with the airport link. And if we look at some of the challenges uh, that we face uh, in Glasgow, in particular in the M8 motorway, it will continue to be a challenge uh, in respect of the build-up of uh, traffic that takes place to and from that very link. So I think for John Mason to be an apologist uh, for the SNP and to apologise in such a form to say uh, that, yes, you have a perfectly substantial bus link in place is absolutely wrong and shows how of touch that John Mason and the SNP are in this issue. And actually also looking at the benefit to the economy uh, of this investment in the Glasgow Airport link for every £1.20 spent on this, we would have benefited £1.25 to the Scottish economy. So the actual benefit to the Scottish economy, economy alone uh, would have been substantial benefit in that respect. President Oster, can I just conclude on one other project, and a more positive note, and one that I would like to, to take forward with the Scottish Government, uh, and in doing so, can I pay tribute to the campaigning skills of Ken Sullivan, who has uh, taken forward the argument for uh, Glasgow's Crossrail. Uh, project, or some very powerful arguments have been made uh, by the campaigners in favour of the Glasgow's uh, Crossrail project. And I would ask the government to take on board and take, it, take into consideration the additional borrowing powers that will be available to them uh, to take forward this project. And I would ask the Minister in his concluding uh, remarks to, to, to comment specifically on uh, the Glasgow Crossrail project and how indeed we can work together uh, in what would be a very important uh, project for Glasgow and, and perhaps in some way uh, redeem themselves with, in respect of the cancelling uh, of the Garrow project. So can I just say in conclusion, uh, President Officer, once again, I think we all uh, welcome this debate. I think there are some very positive aspects of the uh, government's proposals that have been brought forward today and we welcome them. But there are some other elements of this which I hope uh, we can work together with the government in taking forward. But of course we have to expose uh, some of those cancelled projects which have been unacceptable in the history of this government. 
Many thanks. And I now call Jim Eady to be followed by Linda Fabiani. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government, as we have heard this afternoon, has maintained investment in infrastructure in key areas such as transport, health, schools and housing. And it has done so against a backdrop of austerity and a cut to its capital budget of one quarter imposed by Westminster, however unpalatable that fact may be to members on uh, the Liberal, Democrat and Conservative benches. The Infrastructure Investment Plan published in 2011 sets out the ambition to invest billions of pounds in more than 80 major capital projects between now and 2030. And considering that the Scottish Government's economic strategy aims to grow our economy, it is vital that we plan for the future. My own constituency of Edinburgh Southern is seeing excellent development in its schools and hospitals. And the 1.25 billion Scotland Schools for the Future programme is delivering for our communities. Both Muir High School and James Gillespie's High School cater to the young people of my constituency, and both schools are finally seeing much-needed new facilities being built. Work began last year on a new Muir High School building in Fountain Bridge on a brownfield site at the former Fountain Brewery. With an estimated cost of between 20 to 30 million pounds, it will see around 1,165 pupils benefiting from fantastic new facilities, which will provide an impressive learning environment. James Gillespie's High School is also seeing investment. I was delighted to attend the ceremony to mark the construction progress of the rebuild project in May of last year, alongside the headmaster, Donald J. Macdonald and pupils from the school. This £34 million project will see brand new facilities being built, which will cater for 1,150 pupils. And the Scottish Government has pledged to support more than £20 million of the cost of this project. Both these projects are expected to be completed by the summer of 2016. However, these school developments are not just about planning for the future. They contribute to Scotland's economy now, and this is a key part of the Government's infrastructure investment plan. Increased spending in infrastructure programmes such as these not only equips our young people with a first-class education in new modern facilities, it also has a direct impact on Scotland's economy, supporting jobs and apprenticeships locally. The Scottish Government is not just investing in new schools. Following the tragic death of Keen Wallace Bennett at Liberton High School last year, the existing gym hall has now been demolished and work is underway to replace it with new facilities. The City of Edinburgh Council estimates the cost at up to £2.5 billion and the Scottish Government's offer to contribute two-thirds of this expenditure is to be welcomed. Edinburgh has also seen much needed investment in its hospitals, including the Royal Edinburgh Hospital and the Royal Hospital for Sick Children. The new Royal Hospital for Sick Children will be located at the site of the existing Edinburgh Royal Infirmary at Little France, and the Department of Clinical Neurosciences will also be based there. This will create a world-class centre of excellence on a single site, and work is due to start in summer 2017 to deliver this £227 million investment. We are also due to see the redevelopment of the Royal Edinburgh campus at Morningside in four phases over the next ten years. Many local people were disappointed that the Tipperland Bowling Club could not be accommodated within the new plans despite having been part of the initial agreement document and the revised proposals. A serious question remains over whether the Health Board have followed through on the historic commitments which they made in 1978 to provide equivalent facilities if the site was ever required for future building. But that is not a matter for today. The £48 million Phase 1 development started in January 2015 and is expected to be completed by autumn 2016. This includes new accommodation for an adult mental inpatient service, older people's mental health assessment, an intensive psychiatric care service and the new Robert Ferguson National Brain Injury Unit. In November 2015, the Scottish Government committed a further £120 million for future phases of campus redevelopment. This investment will allow the Royal Edinburgh Hospital to become the premier mental health facility in Scotland with better public access through the site, including paths and cycleways. And that final point allows me to return to a favourite subject of mine, which is, of course, investment in cycling infrastructure. I was delighted that the Deputy First Minister, uh, John Swinney, heeded my call and provided some £3.9 million of the money coming to Scotland through the Barnet Formula for investment in cycling. And this year, the largest ever Scottish Government investment, almost £40 million, is going into cycling and walking. It is now encouraging to see the difference which this investment is making, whether it be the £750,000 to plug the gap in the National Cycle Network at Strathire to Kingshouse in partnership with Loch Lomond and Trossachs National 
Park or closer to home in Edinburgh, where additional funding of up to £3.6 million has been earmarked for Leith Walk for the creation of an exemplar urban corridor to prioritise walking and cycling. Much of this investment is matched by partners, for example, through the Community Links programme of £19 million. Sustrans generated some further £25 million in match funding in 2014-15. Presiding officer, I want to end with a reference to skills. In order to successfully build and maintain future first-rate infrastructure, such as our schools and hospitals, we must ensure that the workforce in the construction and engineering sectors are fully equipped with the relevant skills and training. We need to ensure that colleges across Scotland do not discontinue important courses linked to our construction and engineering industries. The continuation of the National Certificate and Higher National Certificate Building Services Engineering courses, which are currently under threat at Edinburgh College, are designed to directly prepare young people to work in the engineering and construction industry. These qualifications offer a clear and proven vocational path to many exciting job opportunities, jobs which are significant in maintaining and developing Scotland's infrastructure. In conclusion, despite the budgetary constraints within which it is compelled to operate, the Scottish Government remains determined to deliver vital infrastructure projects, jobs and economic growth for the future benefit of the people of Scotland. Many thanks. And I now call Linda Fabiani to be followed by Margaret McDougall. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm tempted to say I agree with Jim Eady and sit down, <laughs> uh, because I thought he spoke. Oh, I thought, thank you very much, Gavin Brown. <laughs> um, it was really interesting um, reading the, the government, Scottish Government's motion, because I mean, in itself it's, it's uh, almost like a piece of literature, but that, that's testament to the amount of work that's been done here and um, the amount of things that have to be said. And also refreshing my own memory about the Infrastructure Investment Plan, the update in 2013. Um, a lot of things in here that are, are ongoing since the, the time that the first infrastructure investment plan was published and, and even the update. And one thing I would like to say right at the start, I was very pleased to hear Mary Fee um, saying that they very much support Scotland being included in HS2. And I hope that the other parties too will be able to confirm that support in their closing speeches so that we have the strength uh, of this parliament behind the government when they make the case, as far as I'm concerned, um, a case that has to be made for bringing high-speed rail to Scotland. Um, then looking at the, the amendments that have been put in, some concerning things in there. Um, I noted that, that Paul Martin said that generally there's an agreement uh, that we go forward in the infrastructure here with some um, you know, justifiable concerns about different things. But one thing that did strike me looking at Crossrail in the Labour motion was that, um, you know, we haven't heard a lot of the unionist parties talking about the London Crossrail project and the fact that uh, Scotland has been contributing to that. And uh, to then think what indeed Scotland could do with fiscal autonomy with that £400 million share. But there you go. Also looking at the Liberal motion, um, which is expressing concern about the SNP's fiscal plans, but increasing debt and diverting money from infrastructure to debt interest for a generation. Well, you know, I absolutely believe that um, we have made the case and shown the case that you can manage the deficit down without actually attacking the social fabric of society, which is what the, the coalition government in Westminster is quite clearly, clearly doing, uh, in my opinion. And I was interested that Willie Rennie I uh, was talking about the price of borrowing, the price, the price. Well, you know, that's an argument against any borrowing whatsoever if you start going down that route. But I'll tell you what I think is more important is the price of austerity. Ask people out there about price. Uh, ask them about the price of the austerity measures that are wrecking the fabric of our society and making things really difficult for single people, families, working people. Uh, right across our country. That, that's a, a true price that isn't worth paying for anything as far as I'm concerned. And also I, I noticed concern about the Scottish Futures Trust being mentioned as well. Well, you know what? I'm more concerned about the ongoing price cost of the private finance initiative, which was entered into with great gusto by the Labour Liberal uh, Coalition in this Parliament over the first eight years of it. Not just for the capital cost, but for the ongoing management. And we, we suffer... Uh, still from that, in Lanarkshire Health Board, paying the price of PFI in terms of ancillary services ongoing. And it is, in fact, the Scottish Futures Trust 
that are now looking into uh, the possibility of trying to bring some of that back into um, the public sector, which I think is an admirable thing to be doing. So if we're talking private finance issue, um, initiative and we're talking about the Scottish Futures Trust with a non-profit distribution um, method of financing public projects, I know what I would pick every single time. And I think, too, that this government is to be commended um, for the, the husbandry of resources in terms of infrastructure and the, the way that projects have been managed. Because far too often, with big public sector projects, um, mega projects, I'm absolutely convinced that over the years, and not just in this country, but in many countries, there's a deliberate, almost like a deliberate underestimation of the cost because everybody knows that once something gets far enough down the road, it has to be completed. But I think one thing about this government is that it has been very honest, upfront and transparent about the cost of things and how they are being monitored and managed. And that is showing in some of the results we're getting. In my own constituency, um, I'm really pleased there's been quite a bit of investment going on. Um, the M74 motorway, that, that's going to be a great improvement. The links around the, the Wraith Interchange are going to be a great improvement for the East Cobride Expressway and allowing better access uh, to the rest of Lanarkshire and to our cities, Glasgow and Edinburgh. Just yesterday, I was across looking at the Hunter Health Centre, a £20 million investment by this government. Um, and it's not just straight from government through the Scottish Futures Trust that you often see that government investment in infrastructure. Um, you know, Dolan Aqua Centre and East Cobride, just as an example, um, funding from Sports Scotland. You get a lot of different ways that government actually invest in our infrastructure. But one of the most important things, and one of the things that I actually think is very unique within the British... Uh, well, within the UK at the moment, I think, is this government in Scotland's approach to infrastructure and to investment. So it's not just about big projects, small projects, medium projects, it's about social investment. And investment in people should always count when you're doing these things. Um, and I think that SNP policies such as free childcare, free tuition fees and free prescriptions absolutely highlight our commitment to improving the lives of people and increasing opportunity. And I think Nicola Sturgeon, as First Minister, has made that very, very clear in a lot of the talks that she's done lately, a lot of the presentations she has made. Um, one of the biggest infrastructure projects that we should all be thinking about in this Parliament and for the next Parliament is investment in the infrastructure of our people, because that's how we'll really be successful. Thank you, yeah. President. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Margaret McDougall to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome this opportunity to speak in Building Scotland's Infrastructure for the Future debate. And I'm going to focus on Prestwick Airport because it is an important link, not just to the rest of the UK, but to Europe and beyond. And as such, it's vitally important to the economy of Ayrshire. And of course, it provides thousands of jobs. By way of background, Prestwick Airport is of great strategic importance as it adds around £47.6 million to the Ayrshire economy, while in a wider Scottish context, this figure is £61.6 million. The airport directly supports 300 jobs and around 1,350 jobs indirectly, while the wider aerospace industry around Prestwick is estimated to support around 3,200 jobs. Despite around £10 million in investment from the Scottish Government, the airport still looks very tired and still needs further support to see it through this very difficult period before it can start to make profits so it can pay back the government loans and be sold on. Indeed, the recent Audit Scotland report estimates that total funding needed before a return to profitability in 2021-2022 would be around £40 million. Pounds. So, unfortunately, the Cabinet Secretary has left the Chamber. But does the Cabinet Secretary think this is a reasonable estimate and when can we expect a business plan so that everyone is kept informed of progress? In the last year, there has been a drop in passenger numbers of around 15%, mainly due to Ryanair, the only airline operating from Prestwick at the moment, transferring flights to Glasgow City Airport, but there has been an increase in the freight business over the past year and an encouraging increase in the amount of military usage due to the length and density of composition of the runway. 
while the second runway acts as one of the two principal UK designated hijack sites. The airport also offers other benefits to the aviation industry in Scotland. For example, it is used for flight diversions in bad weather and during aircraft emergencies and in air to sea rescues. The availability of land, services and skills means it offers the best potential in Scotland for aircraft conversion, dismantling and recycling operations. It's also the only airport in Scotland with a direct rail connection on its doorstep. And if the Glasgow Crossrail was developed, the airport would be connected by rail to the rest of Scotland, which none of the other Scottish airports have. So what can be done to get Prestwick, Prestwick Airport back on track? Firstly, through the Smith Commission, Scotland will have control of air passenger duty rates, and it will be possible to reduce or remove this duty. And like all Scottish airports, this is anticipated to hugely increase passenger numbers to Scotland. And perhaps the Cabinet Secretary, when he returns, can give some indication of what they plan to do with APD when they gain that power. Secondly, we should be looking to develop growth through new routes and carriers because, as I mentioned earlier, currently Ryanair are the only passenger airline operating from the airport. And I wonder again if the Cabinet Secretary or perhaps Derek Mackay can update Parliament today whether there has been any progress in securing additional routes or carriers. Take one. Minister. It is the case that the Team Scotland approach will encourage uh, new routes from any of Scotland's airports and of course Presswick would be part of that, uh, bearing in mind the commercial sensitivities that exist as well. Our position on APD is also clear. Can I ask what the Labour Party's position is on APD because it would appear that the Westminster election will come before the transfer of powers to this Parliament? I thank the Minister for that uh, intervention and the Labour Party do support ADP coming to Scotland. I mean, it's in the Smith Commission. The biggest game changer, of course, uh, for Prestwick would be if it was accepted on the 26th of February, which is Friday, as one of the preferred bidders for the UK spaceport and was then successful in that bid as the only spaceport in the UK. To be clear, this wouldn't mean space tourism for the super rich. It would allow Ayrshire to capitalise and play a key role in satellite launching and manufacturing in the space science sector, which is currently earning £11.3 billion in revenues, a figure which grew by 7.2% between 2011 and 2013, despite the recession. Currently, the UK has no satellite launch facilities of its own, so this would be the first of its kind and would open up Prestwick to an untapped wealth of future potential, ideal for taking Scotland's infrastructure to a new dimension. It would have a huge impact on the Scottish economy through promotion of skilled jobs, training facilities, opportunities for high-tech supplies you need and, to bring your marks to close. and the boost for tourism. To conclude, presiding officer, I hope I have highlighted today why reinvigorating Prestwick Airport is not only key to the Ayrshire economy, but the Scottish economy. It has so much future potential to be an integral part of the infrastructure of Scotland by road, rail, sea and the airspace. The reality is, if we properly support Prestwick, it can take Scotland to the moon. Thank you very much. I now call John Mason. Mr Mason, six minutes. I'm sorry, Ms. of course, point in order. Sir, and I don't say this with any great satisfaction, but I think we need to know that either one of the ministers have been missing during the debate, and in summing up, I don't know how the ministers can be expected to sum up if both of them have not been here for the debate during the debate. Would you like to respond, Cabinet Secretary? Could uh, uh, first, uh, uh, officer, I've been out for the last contribution only to go to the toilet. I think that's acceptable. Um, it's one person's contribution. I must have been here for the entire debate otherwise. Thank you. I think you've made your position clear, John Mason. Six minutes. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. Uh, if there's one thing we should never lose sight of, it is the importance of investing for the future. Of course, there's a need for day-to-day -day expenditure like doctors, teachers, medicines right now. 
but we also owe it to our children and future generations to invest in infrastructure. And it does no harm to look back at some of the things that have been achieved. For example, local projects which have benefited uh, my constituency in the east end of Glasgow. The M74 completion, the Airdrie Bathgate rail link, which gives us a direct link to Edinburgh, the Commonwealth Games infrastructure, including the sports facilities, Dolmarnock Station, but especially remembering the village, which is now seeing residents moving in, and a very locally Garrahill Primary School, which has just come into operation. Right now, we see more projects happening in my area, including the M8, M73, M74 improvements, which are actually mentioned in the motion, and the electrification of the Whiflet rail line. And that is not to mention yet a Clyde Gateway Urban Regeneration Company, which has both, a, both has achieved ma some major improvements in Dalmarnock in Glasgow and also across in Rutherglen in South Lanarkshire. Some of these improvements are easy to see, like the new police building, while others are less visible but equally important, such as restoring contaminated land. That can cost millions of pounds, yet opens the doors to future development. Now, we all probably have lists of projects we would like to see happening, and I think we have heard uh, some of these already today, but I would like to concentrate on two areas. The first is housing, and I think there's been a surprising lack of mention of housing thus far in the debate, but I remain convinced that this is one of the best areas of investment. Clearly, that will help people at the bottom end of the scale who are currently in old, difficult to eat houses where they potentially face overcrowding. That has a knock-on effect on the kids' education not to mention other folk who are stuck upstairs in a close when they can no longer manage the stairs. Investment in housing has huge benefits in reducing energy costs, ensuring families have enough space, improving mental health, and many other things. But the second area, not surprisingly, I would like to mention is rail, not least because I am co-convener of the cross-party group on rail, and I'm glad to see that it has had a serious mention uh, today. Of course, when you come to the cross-party group, as I hope the new Minister eh, on Transport will, eh, it does not take long to hear and see the wide range of projects that folk would like to see. As already mentioned, we have seen the Airdrie Bathgate line opened very successfully, and it should be able to handle many extra passengers when Queen Street Station High Level and the tunnel are closed for refurbishment and for the Egypt improvements. On Egypt, I'm delighted it is now going forward below the original budget. The idea of longer trains between Glasgow and Edinburgh was a real breakthrough and saved so much having to be spent on signalling in order to increase the frequency as was the original plan. Electrification around Glasgow has been moving steadily forward after many years of little action, most recently, as I said, the Whiflet line, which runs through Carmyle, Mount Vernon and Bailiston in my constituency and has meant trains able to use the Argyle line and many more destinations for passengers on that route. And clearly the borders line is shaping up well, and I very much look forward to trying it out in the autumn, albeit maybe not on the first day. <laughs> uh, looking forward, the challenge is choosing which projects should be priority. Now, Glasgow Airport has been mentioned and often is mentioned as needing a rail or a tram link. And in an ideal world, I would welcome that. I guess I'm somewhat torn as to how high a priority that would be. In February recess, I flew from Edinburgh to Berlin and then from Berlin back to Glasgow. So I used three airports, and two of these had a rail or a tram link, which were absolutely fine. But the easiest and the quickest trip for me of all three airports was the Glasgow one. The bus into the city centre is absolutely great, although I expect there's except there's problems in the rush hour, but I doubt the train could really compete on time with the bus. So it is a tricky decision whether this should be a priority especially when there are many other transport and non-transport priorities eh, asking for money. Another major rail project which has been mentioned is Crossrail, again, which ideally I would love to see. It would link Ayrshire and Renfrewshire to the rail network north and east of Glasgow, just as the Helensburgh-Edinburgh line takes passengers into and out of Glasgow as well as through the city, so Crossrail could take passengers from Kilmarnock, Ayr and Paisley to Edinburgh as well as passengers eh, coming into Glasgow. But clearly, Crossrail only works if there is a station at Glasgow Cross, which links with the Argyle line underneath with connections to Motherwell, Hamilton and elsewhere. That will not come cheap. It would greatly improve the, the transport connections, would boost a struggling area, but it is a serious expense. 
against these Glasgow-focused projects, albeit benefiting much of the rest of Scotland, I do think there is a need for other issues around the country, double-tracking the line to Aberdeen from the south at the present bottleneck of Montrose. Of course, I'm a Glasgow MSP, but we also ha all have to think nationally. And Aberdeen and the North East surely deserve proper rail line all the way. You need to bring your remarks to a close. And of course, from that perspective, the Perth Inverness line also seriously needs to be jewelled. As I said, I was recently in Berlin. They are investing in a superb city centre station, as well as in a new U-Bahn line. I think today we're all saying that building at Scotland's infrastructure is important, is a good thing. However, the question is whether we are willing to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Are we willing to sacrifice current day-to-day -day revenue expenditure in order to invest more for the future? And I would suggest that the opposition parties would have more credibility if they would suggest areas that need to be cut back in order that we can invest more. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the wind-up speeches. I call Will Lorraine, six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, it would be remiss of me to not begin my summing up without mentioning my sister, who is a, a nurse at the Southern General in Glasgow. Uh, and what Joanne Lamont says about the hospital and the issues around creating the new facility, which she recognises is a great facility, are quite substantial. The impacts on the local community, as my sister has observed, are quite substantial. And I think an awful lot more work will be required to make sure that transition is managed uh, smoothly. So I'm now off the hook uh, with my sister. Um, the Jim Eady, I think, spoke with great pride um, about the projects in his constituency, and I was pleased that he also mentioned cycle routes, something I'm particularly keen on advancing. And John Mason, quite rightly, I think, picked us all up on not mentioning housing infrastructure. But I was delighted that he mentioned the duelling of the line to Aberdeen. I think the fact of Europe's oil capital not having a dueled railway line, I think, is something to our shame and something needs to be put right um, pretty promptly. Um, I know there may be some technical difficulties with doing so, but it should be a top priority. And Nigel Dawn talking um, about broadband was absolutely right too. We need to advance much more significantly than we are just now. The UK Government and the Scottish Government are working in partnership to advance that. Um, but I think it needs to be, um, have a greater, far greater focus than it currently uh, does just now. Um, uh, Stevens. Uh, is the member aware that the Federal Communications Commission in the United States is changing the definition of broadband so nothing under 20 megabits qualifies? Does he think it's time for ambition in the UK to be raised? No, I, I must admit I'm not a student of the Federal Commission in the United States, um, but it's something that I would encourage us to always be aspirational um, to meet um, Stuart Stevenson's aspirations as well. I think that's a valid um, interpretation of his intervention. Um, however, listening to quite a lot of um, SNP members, particularly the Minister, you would think that the, all the investment in these worthy projects, good projects, are a result of the Scottish Government and all the things that we're unable to do is at the fault of the UK Government. The reality is, the reality is that because we have the stability and the security of a strong UK economy, we can afford all of these projects. In fact, we've been able to increase expenditure on capital since 2010 quite significantly. I know it's not as much as some members would like, but we've been able to, through that solid management of the economy that's created 170,000 jobs, GTP is up, but in fact, of the G8, we're performing incredibly well. And our bond yields, as a result, not just now, and our bond yields, as a result, are relatively low. That allows us to borrow even more. So I think it's worth reflecting. When, when the members talk about, with great pride, all these projects that we are um, conducting and investing in in Scotland, that that is possible because of the UK economic strength that we have invested in over the last few years. That is something that we should not um, forget. And I was disappointed with Linda Fabiani when she... I know it's difficult for me to accept that, but sometimes I am um, disappointed with Linda Fabiani. Um, but when she said that she wasn't interested in questions about the Scottish Futures Trust, she would rather look back to a previous government and its failings rather than question her own government. And that's often too, all too often a trademark 
of the SNP backbenchers, unwilling to question their own ministers about significant um, issues. For instance, the HS2. I would still like to know from the minister, and perhaps he's going to include this in his summing up, are they absolutely committed to building the Edinburgh-Glasgow high-speed rail link before the UK government gets its to Birmingham? Is that the case? Is that still the commitment? Or has that changed? Because I would like to know that today. Perhaps Linda Fabiani perhaps could have asked that question as well. And on the Scottish Future Trust, I would like to know all these projects from the eight hubs, how are they going to be impacted by the potential reclassification of the NDP programme? How are they going to be impacted? I would like to know what those are, because we just got a cursory dismissal that it was all going to be fine. Well, we've known from this government before that it often isn't all going to be fine. Sometimes there are difficulties. And also, with this £180 billion commitment to additional spend across the United Kingdom on capital spend, what does that mean for the Scottish Government's fiscal commission, which said that the Scottish Government, in order to meet the aims on the oil fund, should meet the downward trajectory on deficit reduction, matching that of the United Kingdom? What does it mean for that grand, bold commitment that was made in the past? So three big questions that I would have hoped Linda Fabiani would have asked, but un unfortunately she didn't, and perhaps she will in a future debate um, ask those very questions, because we need scrutiny not just from the opposition benches, but from the SNP benches as well. And then we had a little bit of an interchange um, between various members, Stuart Stevenson, Nigel Don, uh, Mike McKenzie, John Mason, about the value of capital investment. Of course, we recognise the value of capital investment. This is all about a balance about, I think, what many finally admitted was about a balance about what we can afford so that we can have the confidence of the international markets who lend us the money to keep the bond yields down in order to make sure we can continue to invest you need to bring your marks up close investment that is of course something that we recognize but it's something that the SNP members should recognize also that it has a price and that price has to be paid for thank you thank you and I call Gavin Brown six minutes Mr Brown uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. We have had a very, I think, interesting debate today. Some highlights uh, include Mike McKenzie celebrating the Queen's Ferry crossing being built on time, uh, a year or two before it's actually complete. Um, we have uh, Mr Stevenson in responding to the train times being slower a century later, suggested that we really shouldn't worry about it because of London to Paris. Air travel used to be faster, apparently, in 1931 than it is today. So I'm sure he says that to his constituents when they ask for the train times to be sped up slightly. Um, we had uh, Mr Don uh, for three minutes telling us how important capital spending was, but then asked, being, when he was asked why none of it was switched or very little of it was switched uh, from revenue, he seemed to suggest things were a bit more complicated than that. And my favourite line of the debate, I wasn't disappointed with Linda Fabiani, I have to say, unlike Willie Rennie. My favourite line of the debate was Linda Fabiani describing Keith Brown's motion as a piece of literature, um, which, which will be uh, hard to beat. And she certainly obviously preferred that to the amendments uh, from any of the parties. Um, presenting officer, the, the Scottish Government has done some good work in relation to infrastructure and transport and housing in other parts, and it would be churlish uh, to try and suggest uh, entirely otherwise. But I think it is the job of opposition to put forward the key questions where things aren't going well and where things uh, are clearly going wrong. One of the questions I put to uh, the Infrastructure Minister early on in this debate was in relation to NPT. And given the NPD, given the questions that have been asked and given the uh, investigation that is going on, my question was quite simply, when the infrastructure investment plan is published, what assumptions will be made about it? Now, the answer was the assumption was that basically everything will be fine. We don't need to worry about it at all. Well, that was, he, he, can, he can correct me or he can in his speech do the same. But I'm happy to, to give way to him. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank uh, Gavin Brown for taking the intervention? I think I said that our assumption is that this is a viable method of procuring us, and we intend to continue with that. But obviously, we have to meet the challenge which has been set out by Eurostat and work with ONS on that. But our assumption is that this is a viable um, process, and we intend to continue with it. Gavin Brown. I suppose my point is that if, if the ruling goes the way that you don't want it to go, or the way none of us uh, want it to go, I have to say, um, then there will have to be some form of contingency, surely, and there will have to be some form of plan B 
And if the infrastructure investment plan rests entirely on the, assumption that, on the assumption that everything will be fine, then I think we'll all be disappointed and there are bound to be some impacts on projects. That was the reason for, uh, for putting up that question. Um, Presenting Officer Rail has, of course, featured heavily, as indeed it should. And I didn't read out the Transform Scotland uh, quote just to embarrass the government, but I think it's important. If a, 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 a respected organisation who do make a lot of really good points says, you know, as bluntly as this, that it's in dire need of investment, then I do think it's incumbent of all of us to take note of that and to look carefully at the suggestions they make and how we might um, move things forward. Because again, they, they give a direct quote from the then First Minister, Alex Salmond, who said in 2008 that railways must at least compete with roads. Now, if the train time between uh, Edinburgh and Perth uh, is slower now than it was in uh, 1895, um, if the train time between Dundee and Edinburgh is slower now than it was in 1895 as well, um, that compares miserably, of course, to uh, road time. And therefore, it's not even uh, anywhere near competing uh, with road um, if those times or compare poorly to how they did uh, well over 100 years ago. Um, and there is, I think, in, the incumbent on the government to do something about it, to suggest how they're going to make sure that when we have this debate in five years' time or ten years' time, actually the position is somewhat different. Uh, Presenting officer, I do want to uh, question the minister, given that he's, he's here also with the transport minister. Um, there is, uh, in the spring budget revision, uh, which was published just last week, at page 65, there does appear to be in the spring budget revision £74 million pounds, uh, coming out of rail for the financial year 2014-15. Uh, I can obviously lodge a written question to ask why that is the case, but if they have an answer here today, it would be interesting to know why £74 million pounds is coming out of the rail budget this year um, via the spring revision. Uh, with that same uh, thought in mind, uh, presiding officer, also within the spring budget revision, under the heading... Uh, motorways and trunk roads, there appears to be a change of £201.8 million, pounds, and that's a sizable sum, uh, presenting officer, is described as a technical budget adjustment in respect of transport revenue financed infrastructure projects. Now, there may well be a good explanation for that, so I put the same question uh, to the Scottish Government. Uh, why is that case, and what does this £201 million pounds actually represent? Because I think it's quite important uh, that Parliament knows uh, what the situation is. Uh, presenting officer, if we turn back to rail again, of course, it wasn't just Perth to Edinburgh or Edin Edinburgh to Dundee, but we've had some criticisms. The Edinburgh to Gra Glasgow link, of course, was scaled back in some parts. Uh, some of it were cost savings, I accept uh, that entirely, uh, but some of it wasn't. Some of it was a genuine scaling back of the project. Some of it was reducing the journey time by six to eight minutes instead of the 13 minutes uh, as was promised. Um, and the government, though, of course, just described us at the time as being reprofiling, where, of course, I think it was something uh, considerably more than that, and it rightly received uh, lots of criticism at the time. You need uh, to bring officer, the close. Uh, having to close in that case, uh, presenting officer, so let's hear the answers from the government. Um, yes, uh, there are areas where I think they have done well, but, of course, there are areas where there is legitimate criticism, but instead of hiding from that criticism, let's hear the government answer, explain, and then tell us what they're going to do about that criticism. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I now call David Stewart. Mr. Stewart, seven minutes. Mm. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. This has been an excellent debate, I think, with strong, passionate speeches from across the political divide. Well, of course, there's not been complete consensus. My sense of the debate is there's a strong theme this afternoon that infrastructure investment has an essential role in delivering sustainable economic growth. Of course, President Officer, the key questions are which projects where in Scotland that can deliver the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, John Maynard Keynes, who we've heard from once already uh, today, the, of course the renowned economist who played a key role with beverage in designing the post-war welfare state, once argued that during a recession it was worth paying workers to dig holes in the ground and then fill them in again, as this stimulated the economy through the multiplier effect. Of course, that's not feasible today, but the principle behind it remains. How do we identify projects? How do we appraise them? How do we finance and control them at once approved? The Queensbury Crossing, for example, which was obviously mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary, Mary Fee and other speakers, is of course the largest public sector contract uh, since devolution. But, President Officer, I should perhaps declare an interest as a formal member of the Bill Committee. And I spent, uh, which seemed months and months of my life in the last session, 
uh, taking evidence from grandees such as Stuart Stevenson, the former transport minister, uh, about the real micro detail of how this would operate in practice. And it's funny, it's almost full circle, because I've now joined the ICI committee, which took evidence from the project director last week. And it's interesting to note that within the project's financial plan is an item for optimism biased, which is the psychological trend towards assuming everything will be all right on the night in terms of cost. I, and just, one, just one second. I, I'm getting the project uh, done on time. Happy to intervene, I'll allow the intervention. Mr. Stevenson. Um, I wonder if the member is aware that when officials first came to me when I was Transport Minister, the putative budget for a project not fully developed was 3.4 to 4.3 billion. Will he join with me in congratulating all the engineers and officials and indeed the government who got it down to a price approximately one third of the top uh, value that it was uh, originally thought it might cost. Yeah. You. Thank you, President Officer. I'm sure members across the political divide uh, want good value for money. The point I was going to make is that optimism bias is a part of that original contract. It's quite an interesting concept. But the other posit spin-off, which I'm sure all members will agree from public procurement, is good employment practice. And last week we had an assurance at the committee from the Force Crossing Director that there was now no blacklisting operated by contractors, which I'm sure all members will appreciate, and that there was over 100 apprenticeships and trainees employed in this project. So that's a good positive spin-off. President Officer, could I share Nigel Don's plea that we do not see infrastructure solely through the prism of large-scale capital funding projects alone? Digital infrastructure, as well as communications infrastructure, such as mobile, broadband and Wi-Fi connectivity are, of course, vital pieces to the jigsaw. Let me give you an example. If you were opening a new hotel in the Western Isles and you want to do online booking, it would, of course, affect your business if you had non-existent broadband. I got some figures just this morning which showed that in the breakdown of broadband speeds for every Westminster constituency in the UK, surprise, surprise, Western Isles had the worst rate of speed or the lowest speed. Notwithstanding that, uh, President Officer, I of course welcome, could I just finish on that point, Mr McKenzie? Notwithstanding the above, I of course welcome the BD, uh, BD UK funding, which is enabling Brom Brown rollout uh, throughout the Highlands and Highlands. Mr McKenzie. Right, McKenzie. Yeah, the point I was going to make is that the uh, Scottish Government are currently spending £127 million, being topped up by £19 million from BT to roll out this fibre optic uh, broadband backbone. And that hopefully will see the situation you're describing improve very significantly. I'm sure you would agree with me that the Scottish Government deserve at least some credit for that. David I would give all credit for credit's due, and I think there's been a good positive union dividend, of course, with BD UK, because, of course, this was UK funding. I think um, Gavin Brown rightly mentioned Transform Scotland in the brief today, making the reasonable point that rail must compete with roads, which echoed, I believe, Alex Salmond's quote as First Minister in 2008. But, of course, the third national planning framework in 2014 had an aspiration to complete electrification of rail between all our cities. Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary or the Minister in the wind-up could provide an update of where we are in this issue. When will Glasgow, Edinburgh to uh, Inverness be uh, electrified uh, north of Perth? Uh, perhaps in the remaining minutes I can mention just a couple of contributions beside an officer. I think Mary Fee made some excellent points about community engagement and low carbon infrastructure. I enjoyed uh, Gavin Brown's amusing and insightful analysis. He's always very professional and well informed, particularly in financial issues, and has shared his issue about high speed uh, rail. I agreed with Willie Rennie's points uh, about the breakdown of the, of the budget. And Mike McKenzie, although he stole my line about Keynes, I'll forgive him and say that it's a broad church, <laughs> Mr McKenzie. Um, also, Joanne Lamont's made some excellent points about the very positive nature of the South Glasgow Hospital. But I think we all have to recognise the impact that it's had uh, on local communities, particularly around parking uh, and transport. And I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary uh, will pick that up. Stuart Stevenson, as always, is interesting and amusing. Uh, I'm not quite sure if he's the father of the house yet, but he certainly his comments. Uh, I wasn't sure whether he had invented penicillin and rail as well in his comments, but perhaps I, I misunderstood his comments. I uh, particularly liked his point about uh, drivers passing over tokens in some of our rail uh, journeys uh, north of here. I agreed very much with Nigel Don's comments, uh, particularly on broadband, and I think Paul, Par Paul Martin made some excellent points uh, about, uh, about Garl. 
And, and Margaret McDougall, I think, made an excellent point about Presswick. I think her line about Scotland could have a route to the moon in terms of the application of the spaceport is one uh, that I will remember uh, for the future. So in conclusion, I think I'm just out of time. We argue that we, that we believe that we should have uh, deliver a strategic investment infrastructure that's essential to achieving sustainable economic growth. Um, I believe that members across the chamber can support our amendment which calls for new projects to be developed in a more strategic way, uh, for example, speeding up rail electrification, development of cross rail, and finally, a future commitment to a not-for-profit rail operator so customers get the profit, not groups of shareholders or foreign governments. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Stewart. I now call the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Nine minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I think, uh, as Dave Stewart said, it's generally been uh, quite a good debate. Um, unsurprisingly, I suppose, uh, individual members have been wanting to highlight uh, issues and projects which are particularly important to them, and that's natural enough. Um, different parties also have different priorities, uh, although I can't really recall off the top of my head of any proposal coming from any other party that's changed a budget in terms of an infrastructure project. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can actually would be back in 2007 when the other parties all voted for the trams project against the Scottish Government. Uh, and uh, aside from that, I think we must by um, implication share many of the same priorities in terms of the infrastructure projects which we've actually uh, persisted with. Uh, to pick up the uh, two points just uh, laterally made there by Dave Stewart, if I could, first of all, um, both Nigel Don and Stuart Stevenson made a plea for more rail expenditure vis-à-vis -vis road expenditure. It may surprise them to know that for uh, different periods over the last few years, rail expenditure has exceeded the expenditure that we've made uh, on roads. Um, it's worth uh, bearing that in mind. A £5 billion programme over the control period, period is a huge amount of money, even though I think I would recognise that given the nature of the rail network throughout Scotland, the lack of investment right through the time of British Rail when they had to have the 8% rate of return has meant that that's a very big project to undertake. I think we've made substantial progress with Airdrie to Bathgate, Stirling Alawak and Cardin, Borders Rail and many other projects. But I do, uh, of course, accept the point there's more that we'd like to do in that, but we have to be guided by uh, resources. Uh, Jan Lamont made the point, uh, first of all, I was grateful that she mentioned the M74, which I don't think I had mentioned, and I think she's right to say that's produced tremendous benefits uh, in, in the west of Scotland um, in terms of uh, freeing up congestion in particular, but also for ease of access, not least into Glasgow Airport, which many people have said to me has been transformed by the uh, completion of that uh, road. Uh, she also made a, a number of points about the new hospital. In fact, when I uh, went for this reprehensible comfort break, this is one of the things which I ended up talking about with uh, Jan Lamont at some length. Uh, and she makes a fair point, and she has raised it already with the Cabinet Secretary for Health. Um, and I did uh, commit uh, to, uh, when I uh, was speaking with her subsequently, to raise it again with the Cabinet Secretary for Health. I don't know whether uh, Jan Lamont is aware she might be that there's a meeting taking place on the 2nd of March which will, I think, as she was suggesting, include the Scottish Government, uh, health and transport elements of the Scottish Government, uh, NHS Greater Glasgow, uh, Glasgow City Council and SPT will all be involved at that meeting. I think that's the kind of uh, corporate joint approach that she was asking for and I undertake to make sure that she's kept up to date about the outcome from that meeting. Um, Jim Eady, I think, uh, was the only person that, that I recalled mentioning uh, at length uh, cycling and walking, quite rightly, the record expenditure which is being put into that. And he mentioned two particular projects, one the £3.6 million pound exemplar project on Leith Walk, uh, and also the one uh, at Strathire, which helps to complete that part of the national cycle network. And these are very important, not just for cycling, crucially, uh, but also for uh, walking as well, which is uh, very important and can be as, not, uh, as beneficial, if not more beneficial, certainly in terms of health uh, than even cycling. So we are delighted to have put that kind of money in this year and it builds on previous efforts in previous years. I said there was a second point which Dave Stewart made, and I think this is an important point because I think there is genuinely some confusion on the Labour benches in relation to this. The current legislation that we have allows us to have a not-for-profit bid for the railways. It always has done. That's not changing with Smith, as has been suggested in some press releases. What is changing with Smith, because we made the representation to that effect, is it will now be, if this goes through and when this goes through, able to make a public sector bid. 
And in fact, you can go beyond that and you can ask whether you can make a direct award, something not currently made provision for within the Smith recommendations. So we are the ones that have proposed that. We'd like to have seen a not-for-profit bid coming forward. Uh, but to be honest, the idea, as has been mentioned by some other Labour members, that this equates to the renationalisation of the railways cannot happen if you are committed to franchising. You cannot have the two things. You can't have franchising and nationalisation. You certainly can't guarantee it. So I think there is some confusion about that, and it's as well that we try and clarify that at this stage. In relation to Paul Martin's point about Rob Royston, he and I have discussed this in the past. I've tried to encourage him and others to come forward with a proposal for that. I should say that none of the monies within the Station Investment Fund, which equates to £30 million, has yet been dispersed. There are a, number of, a very large number of projects which have come forward, at least two of which I would say would be um, further advanced than Rob Royston. In fact, uh, there's not many which have come that far advanced because of what he mentioned in terms of trying to work up a case. So the sooner that can be done, uh, I've said already, there's uh, obviously a very good case to be made, but the case has to be brought forward to the Stations Investment Fund, and it will be for Derek Mackay to look at that when that comes forward. But we can't do anything until we get that uh, application in. Mention was made uh, of high-speed rail. Uh, G Gavin Brown spoke in lurid terms about what I was going to do to the opposition parties, uh, reading from the Scotsman. Well, I did check. I did check with the um, statement which I had put out, and it said I would challenge the other parties. That was a, well, that's what it says. So, and I did challenge the parties. And I have to say that PA are running with a story now uh, that uh, I've been successful in getting a commitment from each of the three parties for bringing high-speed rail to Scotland. Now, Gavin Brown and I think Willie Rennie said that this should be no surprise to anybody. I can tell you it is. If, I've, if like me, you've talked to UK ministers and even opposition spokespeople and tried to get a commitment to bring high-speed rail to Scotland, there's never been that commitment. Now, if you're saying there is, it really, we have to move on to the next stage. I'm delighted that each of the opposition parties have said now that they're committed to high-speed rail. The point is you've got to convince those that are taking the decisions down in Westminster that they should be bringing high-speed rail. There is no proposal from the Liberal Democrats, from the Conservatives, to bring high-speed rail to Scotland. And just to get an idea of the significance of it, we are talking about a massive benefit, not just to Scotland, but to the whole of the UK. It's not a one-way thing. Obviously, there's massive benefits if you join the second most economically active part of the UK, the Central Belt of Scotland, with uh, England. You get massive benefits both ways, and you get benefits further north as well from that improved uh, connection. But there is no proposal. There is no proposal from the UK government, despite being prompted endless times for them to bring high-speed rail to Scotland. And if... if uh, sorry, I, thought Gavin Brown was going, I thought Gavin Brown looked to intervene there. Uh, uh, if he's going to restate the commitment, and if Willie Rennie is going to tell us that he's now going to ask for the first time Susan Kramer and others to support high-speed rail coming to Scotland, then I'd be delighted to let him intervene. Willie Rennie. The Minister seems to be pleading with other members rather than taking an intervention from myself. Um, can he answer the question? Can he answer the question that I posed earlier on that he's failed to answer so far? His minister, his government said that they would build the Edinburgh to Glasgow high-speed rail link before the UK government invested in the line to Birmingham. Is that still the case? Is that still the commitment? Cabinet Secretary. I've made very clear, as we have made very clear in the past, that we've undertaken the study on that. But if he thinks it makes sense to have a high-speed rail link between Edinburgh and Glasgow without knowing whether we're to have a high-speed rail link bring up from the south, he basically does not understand transport projects. Just think about it for a short time. And can I say, can I come back to Willie Rennie on two points that he made? The first one, I think, was utterly disingenuous. When he said that it applied that classification or reclassification of NDP projects was a problem or a failure on the part of the Scottish Government, he has, well, he's nodding now. Well, he must know. Surely he must know. The discussions which the Finance Secretary has had with his counterparts in Westminster, who have the same challenge in terms of classification and work very closely to make sure that we have budget cover for the projects which we intend to take forward. He knows that and, despite that, tries to portray that as a problem or a failure on part of the Scottish Government. And that's disingenuous. And on his other point about the First Minister's statement in terms of £180 billion of borrowing, he challenged me to provide the figures. I gave him the figures and then he still complained. 
But the vital point is, I think Linda Fabiani made the point, it's an ideological difference. We are committed to an alternative to austerity. You are committed to austerity. That's what you've done for the last five years. You've failed to get the budget deficit down, as you said you would do. Instead of a £5 billion surplus, you've got a £50 billion deficit. So even according to the, the things that you've said, you failed to do. And the difference is, it's not like FDR with a new deal. With a coalition, you get a bum deal. You've had nothing at the end but austerity. <laughs> and we propose a different course of action. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Bolton Scotland infrastructure for the future. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 12384 in the name of Fergus Ewing on the Small Business Enterprise and Employment Bill UK legislation and a call on Fergus Ewing to move the motion. Formally moved. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. Before we move to decision time, I undertook to come back to the Chamber on an issue raised by the Minister Fergus Ewing during the Stage 3 debate on the legal writing bills. The Minister queried whether this was the first bill to have completed its passage through the Parliament unamended. I thought not, um, but I did promise to come back. And we have checked this afternoon, and as I suspected, there are a number of examples, um, an early one being the Census Amendment Scotland Bill in March 2000. There are at least 10 such similar bills which completed their passage unamended. And I have in my hand a little list. I could read it to you, but I think uh, members would probably prefer that I give it to the Minister at the end of business. Um, I think he would enjoy that. Um, there are six questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 12381 in the name of Fergus Ewing on the legal writings counterparts and delivery Scotland bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to and the legal writings counterparts and delivery Scotland bill, the Parliament's first law commission bill, is passed. <laughs> can we move on to the next question and can I remind members that in relation to the debate on building Scotland's infrastructure for the future, if the amendment in the name of Mary Fee is agreed, the amendments in the name of Gavin Brown and Willie Rennie fall. The question is that amendment number 12382.3 in the name of Mary Fee, which seeks to amend motion number 12382 in the name of Keith Brown on Scotland's infrastructure be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12382.3 in the name of Mary Fee is as follows. Yes, 34. No, 76. There were four abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Now can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Gavin Brown is agreed, the amendment in the name of Willie Rennie falls. The question is that amendment number 12382.1 in the name of Gavin Brown, which seeks to amend motion number 12382 in the name of Keith Brown on Scotland's infrastructure be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now.
the result of the vote on amendment number 1238.1 in the name of Gavin Brown is as follows. Yes, 43. No, 67. There were four abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 1238.2 in the name of Willie Rennie, which seeks to amend motion number 12382 in the name of Keith Brown on Scotland's infrastructure be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members, you cancel votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12382.2 in the name of Willie Rennie is as follows. Yes, 13. No, 100. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12382 in the name of Keith Brown on Scotland's infrastructure be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cancel the votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12382 in the name of Keith Brown is as follows. Yes, 62. No, 17. There were 34 abstentions. The amendment, sorry, the motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12384 in the name of Fergus Ewing on Small Business Enterprise Employment Bill UK legislation be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.